I cannot believe that we lost Brian Stelter and Liz Cheney in the same week. American democracy is dead, my <laughs> friends. So sad. You know, it actually it took me a lot of practice to be able to say that without breaking out into laughing. I was, it was really easy for me to tweet that. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, Brian Stelter's out. He was fired from CNN. Well, okay, I don't know if he was fired, but they canceled his show, which basically means he's fired, I guess. The entire staff, gone. Rumors are now circulating. We're hearing that Jim Acosta may be next in line with the next couple of weeks. It may even be Don Lemon who is out. CNN, CNN is collapsing. And, you know, on Tuesday, just two days ago, Liz Cheney lost her primary. And we were all just so excited to see the establishment crumble. To see now these moves made against CNN, it's a, uh, uh, we're going into the midterms, and I just got to warn everybody, don't sit back thinking you got it in the bag, because this is what they're, they're trying to lull you into a false sense of security. Look at all these good things. No, we got to make sure that we, we go in, we get all our friends out, and we go and vote. So we'll talk about that. Plus, Donald Trump, the madman, has endorsed Democrats, fulfilling the prophecy. The Babylon Bee wrote that in a genius move, Donald Trump uh, endorses or supports impeachment, forcing Democrats to oppose. Donald Trump has now endorsed the Democrat who led the impeachment charge against him. (laughs) And other Democrats have taken the bait. No joke. They're acting like he literally endorsed Democrats. This is amazing. What a ridiculous time to be alive. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get started, head over to TimCast.com. Become a member to support our work directly, and you will get access to our exclusive shows on TimCast. Tonight at 11 p.m., we're going to have a members-only, uncensored TimCast after show. That'll be up on the website, the members-only section. And we got Cast Castle, Tales from the Inverted World, more to come. So don't forget to also smash that like button right now. Subscribe to this channel. Share the show with your friends. Joining us tonight to talk about all this and more is Mike Glover. What's going on? Who are you, Mike Glover? Nobody really is important. I mean, just I'm just a guy. <laughs> no, yeah. Some guy. Yeah, so I, I, I'm um, a former special operations guy. I'm also a contractor for the CIA. Um, I also own a company called Philcraft Survival that teaches preparedness and everything, uh, anything revolving a, a worst case scenario to citizens, situational awareness, tactical training, the list goes on. And then... Uh, I've been recently canceled, as so, you know. So hold on. You're quite literally a fed. I am a bootlicker, according to a <laughs> oh lot of people. Boy. But wait, no, here's a story. Am I to say that? Bootlicker? Yeah, is yeah, a, yeah. yeah. But, but they also accuse you of being, ext- being an extremist? Yes. So on one Systems side, broken, yeah, <laughs> there's a, so there was an article that was released when I started this group called American Contingency, which is like a community group based on the BLM and Antifa activities, which you're very familiar with. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons why a, a lot of these things have evolved out of that. That's the good that came out of the bad. And I started this American contingency idea of just pulling people together, doing what a special operations sergeant major would do. Like, hey, let's let's leverage our assets and do something positive here. And then I was called immediately a right wing extremist and white nationalist, which is crazy because <laughs> I identify as an Asian guy. And um, and so, well, well I, to clarify, you're quite literally an Asian guy. I'm quite literally a six foot one Asian man, uh, which is rare. <laughs> but um, I, I'm half Korean. My dad was in the army. Met my mom in Korea, in Korea when he was stationed there. And I took offense to this, but I could do nothing because all the platforms canceled me: Facebook, wow. Instagram. Uh, I fought to get those back and got a couple of them back, but not before USA Today advertised the entire article that was written by obviously a, a leftist journalist who was who had an agenda. Uh, CNN reached out to me, uh, reached out to me and said, "Hey, we want to talk to you because they were running a piece on Proud Boys." Talked to me for an hour and realized, oh, this dude's just a normal guy who's trying to run a business and and be positive in his community. They moved past that. And then of recent, Project Veritas released this document that said American Contingency is a militia violent extremist organi- organization, a banner for all of these white nationalists and domestic extremists. It's so, crazy. It's crazy because I'm not any of that. People who know me, I'm very moderate and I'm, I'm not on the fringes of anything because that's just not how I roll. Wow. All right. We'll talk about that, man. Thanks for coming. It's yeah. Thank you. We got Hannah Claire Brimelow hanging out. Hi, I'm Hannah Claire Brimelow. I'm a writer for this cool news site called TimCast.com. It is pretty cool. It's the coolest. I'm uh, Ian Crossan and a wild wizard. Sometimes I wonder, why am I here? And then I realize it's to cast magic. That's right. No, it's just to be cool. <laughs> He's, it, it, if you guys watched Cast Castle, you'll see me walk in and you'll get a full view of the table. 
And I just point out that it's just, I don't know what's going on with this mess. You guys got to get a look at these gems. This is an aquamarine. Not only does he have a ton of gems, but he has a miniature version of himself. That is, it's mm, awesome. I didn't choose that. That just appeared. <laughs> Someone sent that it to me. It just appeared here? I can't deny what it. It's got pins here. Yeah. That's weird. That's yeah. pins. It's like when people <laughs> laud love and, and adulation on you, like, don't, don't, like, don't fall for it, but don't, don't deny it. Ian know? came in here in the middle of the night and put that little Ian there. Yeah. Show the, no, show, the, show the little Ian. He's trying to make himself seem more mysterious. Right. The man <laughs> of the hour. Of so cute. I love him. Too. Somebody made him for that's us. He's even got that crease too, right oh, there. Oh, one of those. Yeah. yeah. That's cute, right? That's yeah, nice. Yeah. Bobblehead. Yeah. Someone well, made this. He doesn't yeah, have shoes awesome. on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's not wearing <laughs> shoes. <laughs> he's great. Yeah, um, Ian has one of those, and I also have one of those, but she lives at home. Tim has one, too, that has a little skateboard. Very hard to balance, but we appreciate whoever made those make those for us. Mm. All right, let's get into it. All right, the first big story from TimCast.com. Brian Stelter to leave CNN. No. Reliable sources canceled. No. The media analysis show has been on the air since 1993. I didn't realize wow. that. Yeah. They, they, they put Brian Stelter on that show? No, he has a predecessor. Um, so his predecessor is a man named Howard Kurtz. And he eventually left CNN. He left um, Reliable Sources to go on to be with Fox, who he's still with today. But So, so Brian Stelter is given this show. And mm -hmm. then burns it to the ground and yeah. destroys the legacy of a 30 year old show. And I think this whole, uh, this story for me is interesting because it's a web. You can see where everyone comes from. Brian Seltzer, he came from the New York Times and yeah. then they moved to, to Fox Media. Like everyone is so interconnected in this world that like. Incestuous. Yes, yes. that's a great word yes. for Media it. Media incest. Yeah, and so to a certain extent, I know there's been some speculation about where he'll go next. Uh, and that's why I think companies like ours and platforms like YouTube are so interesting because they disrupt this uh, member sharing that. So you're saying my, we should we should hire Brian Stelter? Yes. <laughs> Only if I re retain my rank as senior reporter and he has to start as a junior staff. I didn't yes. say as a reporter. We got some, we, we got some garbage. He wants to hang out with the chickens. We got yeah, chickens. Yeah, yeah, he can, yeah. Kim can train him. I love yeah. it. I think it's great. Look, he's, you know, I, I'm uh, reluctant often to be so crass in reference to people. But this guy is is seriously one of the worst in media. No matter what happens, he's he always finds a way into weaseling some kind of shill defense for the establishment, no matter what they do. Even going as far as to tell people not to watch other propaganda networks, only watch us. Mm -hmm. I get it. If you know if you're dependent on ratings, you want to convince everybody, just keep watching us, keep watching us. But if you want to be honest about the idea of spreading truth and doing journalism, then what we say here is, oh, you should watch other shows. You should watch the left. You should watch the right. You should watch CNN, Fox News. Determine for yourself who you think is telling the truth and who you can trust. Yeah, I think uh, a sign of greatness and confidence is when you, you encourage other people to go experience other things other than you. And then because they do and they trust you and they find out that their life is better as a result, then they come back and they want to hear more from what, what else should I do? Because you're giving them honest, like, you know, objective advice yeah I, li I like the idea that his new boss came out and and said hey we're gonna get back to telling news stories and and how can you argue or debate with that you know he said hey we're a little bit too political we want to get back to our origin story which is telling news which is the right thing that's what you do you know CNN really was the, the top player for news for a long time mm -hmm. and when a story broke you turn CNN on and they destroyed that mm -hmm. with Chris Cuomo with Don Lemon and to a lesser extent with Brian Stelter. They, you know, Chris Cuomo faking being in COVID quarantine is one of the biggest media scandals of, of, of our generations, of, of our generation. And it's, it's even, the, even uh, Ben Smith, the New York Times called him out. Like this was not something they could have just pretended didn't happen. Everybody was bringing up the fact that Chris Cuomo pretended to be in quarantine. And so Jeff Zucker came in and he turned CNN into reality TV he had a personal vendetta against Donald Trump. He hated the man. And so he nuked an entire legacy. How amazing is that? Trump really, I don't know if he broke the minds of these people or if he, like some kind of wizard, pulled it to the front and center for us to see. But these people's brains shattered when, when Donald Trump became president. Yeah, it was the news that I leaned on when I was going through special operations training, special forces training, uh, when the global war on terror was initiating with the invasion of Iraq and we were already in Afghanistan, CNN is the coverage I depended and leaned on for accurate information, which is crazy because, you know, fighting the war and then being away from home and not paying attention to news to come home to that. I think in 2016, when I started paying attention again to the news, it's like, what what's going on here? It's a completely different world. Well, I, I used to talk about uh, a couple of years ago, the CNN challenge. 
the CNN challenge was to turn on CNN and then uh, it was to, it was to be watching Fox News and then turn on CNN and the challenge was can you find a time when they're not talking about Trump mm. good luck mm-hmm. and so uh, it used to be that I would I would when I'm doing work I have CNN on while I'm working and it's for if like breaking news happens they'll have it very quickly mm-hmm. and then eventually uh, something happened with uh, it was Iran it was protests or something like that. And they were talking about Trump. And then I was like, I'm seeing on Twitter, something's going on. And so I switched to Fox and there it is. Front and center on Fox News, protests erupting in Iran. And I was like, oh, wow. Switch back to CNN. And then I was like, what are they doing? There's like major international crisis happening. And they're talking about Trump. Trump's not, Trump's not even relevant to the news right now. Like he didn't do anything. They were just talking about him for the sake of talking about him. And so then something else happened later where there was like a major flood. I can't remember exactly where. And by this, at this point, I'm only watching, you know, America's newsroom on Fox because they actually were covering news. And then I thought to myself, I bet if I turn on CNN, it's Trump. Click, boom, there it is. So I filmed it. And I was like, here's the challenge, guys. Like, not a literal challenge, but I was like, yeah. watch. Mm-hmm. That's all it was. They, they, they destroyed what legacy they had. And re- reliable sources. To hear that it's been on the air for nearly 30 years and then Brian Seltzer burnt it to the Crazy. ground. To the ground. And they're suffering. I mean, one of the reasons that I think you pronounced his name Litched, like Chris Litch, who's who's licked. Take, licked? I can't say it. Oh. I did pop culture this week and learned I cannot read anyone's name. That's <laughs> that's that's all I learned. Chris L. Uh, anyways, he has taken over and part of it is to get control of their massive loss of their bleeding viewership and their bleeding profits. So it's, it's there's no way. There's no way for it to start. I mean, one of the things that I found interesting when I was researching for the article was that he has been monitoring who became more partisan under during the years that Donald Trump was in office. And he is, it looks like the reports are that he is wanting to cut as many people who are basically too far gone. There is no way to recover the reputation of their show. Uh, because he thinks that it's more important to bring them back to a moderate platform and on our news. I think that CNN's reputation is so damaged yeah. with so many Americans, that's an almost impossible task. But, you know, he's been given this bleeding ship. I mean, he's got to try and, you know, bail out, bail out. I'm mixing metaphors here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Stop it from sinking somehow. <laughs> yeah. It's bandage the ship, whatever he needs to do. Not, yeah. there's, there's no way. No. There's no, no way. But what will they do? Sell the IP? Like sell the name to Disney or something? Or does Disney already they, own They've already CNN? sold it several times. Well, it's already under Warner Brothers, right? So like it's already a conglomerate of a conglomerate. You know, like it's already mixed in somewhere. I think eventually uh, someone else would maybe overtake them as like the prime uh, left-leaning news outlet, which is weird to even have to say that. Like we should just have news, but of course we can't. Uh, what One of the things I found interesting about Seltzer is he wrote this book about how Fox News is awful and Trump and whatever else. And then he updated it after January 6th to be like, see, I told you guys even worse than ever. And now he is the first one to go. I mean, he has really positioned himself as the anti-Trump fact checking media analyst and uh, his bias is too obvious. Just, what's he going to do? What's, what's he going to go now? Is he gonna... Well, I heard he's going to come work here with the chickens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you Still, know, I, that's, I, I don't trust him with my chickens. He's got to start a show, like his own show where with he who? just uploads videos, interviews YouTube? Tim. I don't know. He Dude, becomes a amazing. YouTube star. Yeah. He copies Tim's format. Like, I don't, I well, love he, to call them podcasts because that's like an Apple thing. Apple iPod is where the podcast co- word comes from. And mm-hmm. I'm tired of it. I don't trust. I don't like Apple. As a, as a company. Vodcast. Vodcast. Stealth should start his own vodcast. Video and then on people demand. are saying he's going to start his own podcast. He's going to start uploading, cli- uploading clips to YouTube. And then his audience, because it's independent media, is going to be very anti-establishment. And he's going to drift further to the right and then eventually have some flipping moment where he's like, I need to blow the whistle on CNN. Jet fuel I feel like he had, doesn't melt steel. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he'd have to do the rounds. Like, you know how we have, uh, you know, conservatives who may fall out fall out of like the establishment. They do some rounds on CNN. They take positions there and they're sort of like a punching bag for a while. I feel like he'd have to do the opposite. He'd have to like get some, I don't think any establishing conservative uh, media would take him, but he would need to sort of do the rounds and be like, well, this is what I meant, and then have this whole redemption arc. I mean, I think it would take a lot longer than people think because he is so publicly associated with being anti-MAGA. Well, Cuomo, he he founded the CCP. Did you guys know that? Yeah, he did. The Chris Cuomo yeah, Project. Correct, yeah. <laughs> he literally calls Dirty. it the, yeah. the Chris Cuomo, Cuomo Project. And no one was like, mm, no, think about this It's a bad idea, dude. You <laughs> should not do that. I think Tucker Carlson is an example that you can 
redeem yourself as like because he was kind of like a partisan hack in 2004 or 5 he struck me as when he wore a bow tie talked about how great the war was i mean at least i that's what i remember him being kind of like a a war hawk and then all of a sudden i know it was john stewart somebody shocked him awake and he realized yo what the hell is this world well he talked he, he, he talks about it on his show where he's like i used to think this you know until i had a conversation with this person and then realized how wrong that was and and he like took that. years for him to get back in people's good graces but with honesty and integrity and consistency you do i i'd be willing to bet that if brian stelter came out in like a month and said i want to blow the whistle on everything cnn was doing <laughs> the right would accept him in two seconds and mm -hmm. say yes yes by all means spill all the beans publish everything and, and we'll hear you out i just wonder if he will though obviously i don't know him personally but like i think it will be very hard for him to to flip like that i think he really sees himself as this like doer of right things progressive cause champion of you know correct journalism i think it's going to take longer. I mean, I think he's going to have to hurt financially before he's willing to give in. It's it's what's weird to see him do is think on his own for in, in depth because <laughs> yeah. he looks like a it's like a talking head, right? Mm -hmm. So he's reading the teleprompter. He probably wrote it deliberately, and he had this deliberate approach to everything. But to actually see him free think through problems and through challenges and politics, that would actually be entertaining to just listen to see if he ends up like a Tucker Carlson who I think is on the right side of what we're talking about. That's the thing about Stelter. He does listen. I, I see him in yeah. clips and times. Sometimes yeah. like he's being humbled where he's like, oh, what mm. have I done? Oh, God. Like There's this Ted Koppel video I reposted. Jen Perlman tweeted it out, so I retweeted it. And Ted Koppel's like, I mean, this is the reason why. I, I don't remember exactly what talking about, why CNN is failing, why why people don't believe you. You talk about Trump every day. If there's 10,000 deaths in Malaysia, maybe it'll get a mention, but then it's just yep. back to Trump, Trump, Trump. And Stelter's like, Insane. just taking it, you know? I mean, what, he's not really trying. it's true. Really, yeah. What was he gonna say? Be like, well, we're, hmm. womp. Yeah. I looked up CNN, what it stands for. Cable News Network. Well, as we all know, cable is done. Mm -hmm. So Bye. as is the C so in CNN, CNN. Yep. what's the new, I mean, get rid of the name. It doesn't make sense anymore. Well, I, you know, look with uh, Liz Cheney on Tuesday being, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the right word? Trying to be polite here. Excised. Yes. I'll say that. Yes. Excised yes. from uh, the GOP. That's a, it's a good day. And then today when uh, I got a message uh, right before this happened, right before it was announced, that someone who has got sources hit me up and said, Stelter is out. Here it comes. And then I was like. It's like, I need more than this. You can't just like DM me. And then I saw like a few minutes later, the breaking reports and I'm like, oh man. And then I got, I got a uh, uh, word. Jim Acosta is going to be next. So, you know, I look forward to it. Um, there, there's some, there's some positive here. Let's jump to this next story and get into the politics of, of, of the day. We have this uh, from TimCast.com. Trump accused of election meddling after endorsing candidates in New York Democratic primary races. I'm sorry. I love this man. This is one of the greatest trolls ever done. Donald Trump endorses lawyer Dan Goldman, who led the impeachment against him, saying lawyer Dan Goldman is running for Congress, New York 10, and it is my great honor to strongly endorse him. I do this not because of the fact that he headed up the impeachment committee and lost, but because he was honorable, fair, and highly intelligent. While it is... Well, it was my honor to beat him and beat him badly. Your favorite part. <laughs> Dan Goldman has a wonderful future ahead. Like, I don't know how anyone sees that, anyone with any modicum of intelligence and believes Trump is literally endorsing the guy when he's he's doing like neg hits. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. It's like a, a backhanded compliment yeah. at, at these guys. Here's, here's He endorsed several other people, but here's the best part. You lean now who is a Democrat, so I've, I looked her up, she's a Democrat assembly member running for New York 10, took the bait and said, Donald Trump just endorsed my multi-millionaire opponent in case you need a reminder of what the stakes are. New York 10, choose your fighter. She couldn't help it. They no. can't help themselves. Trump plays them like a fiddle. And now he's got them infighting over whether or not he actually supports this guy. This is what he has to do. He has the weight of the establishment pushing against him right now. And I've been an advocate of like, if someone's coming at you and putting their full force into you, the best, well, one of the best things you can do is move so that you're not there anymore. And that all that pressure that Donald Trump is like, just goes into this nowhere land and then end up falling forward. Then you reappear and then you're still back to, you know, who you are. The, the prophecy has been fulfilled, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. From the Babylon Bee. Ingenious move. Trump supports impeachment, forcing Democrats to oppose. <laughs> November 18th, 
2019, the beat does it again. Wow. The thing is, his statement has so much early 2016 energy to me. Like, there was a point in his presidency where he really seemed to sort of get lost. They felt like maybe he didn't have uh, the correct support when he was already in the White House. But while he was campaigning, and you know, th throughout, we see it, we see it come and go. He really is just this complete unpredictable force. You can't really tell what he's going to do, and he doesn't want to. Uh, Tr adhere to any traditional standards so it's why it's so funny like this is this is very much a like true spark of trump to me as like when he first announced that he was coming to president it reminds me of all of the debates he did his like booing of hillary clinton on yeah. stage like he doesn't he doesn't behave as they would like him to i'm sure goldman is like what do i do do i release a statement saying no thank you this is so much of what trump does is, is what i've been talking about when i say like throw a pie figuratively like people in power need to to need to to set a tone need to call out the bs need to make a point trump does this all the time mm -hmm. it's 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 quite incredible but uh yeah i have to wonder where we go in this country as this is the current level of politics that we have i mean they they take the bait donald trump trolls the democrats what do, and you, I, what do you think? I think, too, like there is a level of uh, like yesterday I was looking at this article. that was eight of the 10 Republicans who voted against Trump are out. And it's interesting because I think he's trying to show the Democrats that he has influence within their party, like not in the way they're expecting. He has more influence in politics than anyone predicts or is used to. It's very unusual to have a leader who can actually bipartisanly reach across the aisles and be like, oh, I it's not just the Republican primaries that I can influence. I can influence the Democrats, too. He's not even in office right now. I love it. Can you go back to the tweet, the actual tweet? What I, what I find odd about the original and the first one on the left yeah. is there's a dot 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 like, well it's because there's, there's more yeah, well, i just mean i just mean like everything about this <laughs> there's four dots so there's four dots yeah. <laughs> everything about like i just look at it and i i see i see psychological operations campaign it's like a psyop right it's yeah. like exactly what you do when you want to win hearts and minds and it, it, if it's a real endorsement or if it's not a real endorsement what what we realize now is that uh, everybody's talking about it. Yep. And that's what you need when you're trying to campaign early on. We're yep. three years out, two and, a, two and some change out, and we'll start feeling the effects of that like tomorrow. We're feeling it today. And so this is only going to get more extreme but, and, and more difficult. But how much of this is Donald Trump sitting down with a group of like tacticians being like, we need to craft the perfect message, or it's him lounging in a chair watching Tucker Carlson being like I endorse this guy and he like grabs a thing of Cheetos and then just I like I feel it's like both of those I, mean, I think he's good on a whim but I also yeah. think like deliberately uh, people people forget he's a very crafty business person and being in business myself for a short period of time I understand the tactics and even tactics that I brought across the military aisle and planning and strategy he is using all of these tactics to bear and I think he's unpredictable he, he would be unconventional or irregular in his warfare approach while the rest of the establishment uh that you're draining that he's draining is very conventional i'm just thinking about you know they call him a fascist they, they claim he's like worse than hitler could you imagine if donald trump like ever did become a dictator and then <laughs> history is talking about how he rose to power and it's like well he called rosie donald fat pig and then he made a tweet endorsing his opponents <laughs> it's just like wow <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I, you know, you know, the history repeats itself. History rhymes, but I think we're getting something fresh with Donald Trump to a certain degree. I gotta yeah. ask: Is this the 4D chess we were promised? That's kind of what it looks like to me. Yeah, what I like it. Think? When you hate, if you hate somebody, that they are controlling you. If you have a mo so people that he's done that. He, I mean, he's taken control of people's minds, whether yeah. whether they like him or not. Well, especially the ones that hate. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it, that's a way, that's a form of 4D chess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I'm just reading the end of this. Like <laughs> winning against him made me realize how just very talented I am. I <laughs> okay, okay, let me read it. Let me read it. So I read the first part. He goes on to say he will be very compassionate and compromising to those within the within the Republican Party, and will do everything possible to make sure they have a fair chance at winning against the radical left Democrats, who he knows are destroying our country. I would like to thank Dan for fighting so hard for America and for working so tire tirelessly to stop, quote, Trump, end quote. 
He was not easy to beat, but winning against him made me realize just how very talented I am. <laughs> so Most won't read the second one, though. They'll I'm just read so the first. sorry. This just like gets better and better. That's great. Yeah. I hope one person said to him, like, oh, it'd be hilarious if you endorsed the Demo like, Democrat. Like, and then he's like, mm hmm, I'm no, done. Let's do it right now. He's yeah. like, he's like sitting Watch. in like his friend's basement. They're playing pool with the game on. And yeah. they're like, dude, dude, you should endorse the Democrats. Like, oh, I'm totally going to do it. It <laughs> would like, make him drinking. freak out. And they're like, he's like, okay. Oh. That's what I love. Somebody you know, that's, super that's chatted him and was like, you won't do it and he was like oh yes i will yep. yeah i think maybe he has realized that conventional tactics are not the way you win against the liberal economic order right now because they're just conventionally using brute force you know with the fbi raid on the house and things like that so now he's taking an unconventional i think approach mm. we saw we saw the democrats funding republican messaging and the idea was that it was going to hurt trump to mm -hmm. do this i think he was like okay i'll play the game you like mm -hmm. you want to play that game yeah you th so so think the Democrats are like, Trump endorsed these guys, so let's prop them up. Then, in the general, they'll lose. So Trump says, okay, I'll endorse your guys instead. Mm. And does. <laughs> That's what I mean. I think he, they underestimate how much influence he has over everyone. Like, we th see it as like, oh, it's just, just those right people, those conservatives, the MAGA base. But it's really not. Like, Trump is an institution in and of himself. And I think, you know, he is sort of reviving the same kind of disruptive energy that made him stand out initially which made people cover him when he was running in 2016 because they were like what is he doing well yeah, he, he I, put his name in quotes too which is nice because it shows that he's not like he was against me he sees that he's against the idea of what trump yeah. might yeah, be yeah, yeah. yeah but someone said someone was steve steve bannon's mullet responded oh. to you lynn oh, yeah. finally saying that's just <laughs> weird why would he endorse goldman and she said he said it out loud to stop the left I do not believe, I'm sorry, I can't believe that this uh, Yu Lin woman, if I'm pronouncing that right, actually believes it's a real endorsement. Maybe she doesn't know like, the wait, guy. Do, do you think she seriously thinks he... Maybe she's playing her own side, but I don't buy into it. I think she literally probably believes that yeah. it was an endorsement. Oh, well, I mean, well, maybe she's betting off headlines, like enough people yeah, are going to see what, Trump yeah. endorses Goldman. She's like, they aren't going to look into it. I'm going right. to be able to. Yeah. But that would mean that she knows she's lying to her potential constituents. She's a politician. So, mm -hmm. Right. Is she is she lying for votes or is she just really that dumb? I'm going with lying for votes for yeah. 500. Okay. I'm yeah, going with okay. Neither one yeah. seems like a good look, you know? Yeah. <laughs> My guess is ignorant that she doesn't know that was the guy that tried to impeach Trump. No, he, he wrote that. He headed the impeachment committee. It's in the endorsement. Damn, yeah. that I was wrong. That's but so we're also, crazy. I mean, here here's the credit to Trump that's due that a lot of people don't talk about. This is a tactician that killed ISIS. Like yeah. this dude, like we forget about ISIS and all the problems that it was taking over the world. We were about to go to World War X. He did that on his own accord as a commander in chief. And nobody talks about like They ragged that. on him for it. How they did. They ragged like, him. They said, austere scholar. Like, how, how, how did he do it? Well, he, I think he used, I mean, he used a lot of different tactics, but he used special operations, but it wasn't advertised as a war. So it wasn't campaigning with media outlets that were telling all the information. It was a closed, compartmentalized operation that was very deliberate, using Ranger Battalion, using the best special, special mission units in the world, and crushed those guys. And if it wasn't for that, I mean, the things that we saw on the TV when ISIS and their propaganda was affecting the world, everybody was like in fear. You saw little kids running around with guns, killing innocent people from propaganda videos from ISIS. That was a thing. Like we lived in that time. And all of a sudden we woke up one day like COVID and it didn't exist. And it's because of those tactics that he brought to bear. So I say that because he's, a, he's deeply seated in strategy and understanding tactics on all levels. And I think this is an easy PSYOPs campaign for him. Yeah, is, is, is PSYOP the right word? Is a politician, him trying to garner a favor in votes? Is it just, I guess PSYOP is the right thing to call it. It's not, it's not propaganda. I, you, you can call it perhaps black propaganda, but it's not really, right? Yeah, psychological operations would be like the, the intent to twist things around from the get-go, the onset. And whether it was like a haphazard, like, oh, I think I'm just going to do this and blast it out, or, hey, let's meet about this. Either way, it had the same same effect. Are you familiar with the concept of black propaganda? Yeah, for could, sure. Could you explain that? Yeah, I mean, there's, well, propaganda across the board in the psychological campaign has many outlets. I'm not a psychological expert, but psychological operations is a part of what special operations does. And, and every side of the coin, uh, whether it's influencing bad guys to target bad guys, which I've done in the military, um, or it's twisting hearts and minds for 
for egregious reasons. Um, it basically is to control the battlefield with with people's emotions and behaviors in mind. So if you could affect people's emotions, if you could affect people's, I mean, I just did this for a, a, a TV show that we're doing, and uh, we, were, we were talking about our a Asian, very superior um, genetics on before the, can I say that <laughs> before the, the podcast. I wanted that's that. a joke. Yeah. So he's quarter <laughs> Korean. I didn't know that, but yeah. um, um, I'm half Korean. Technically, twenty percent because I'm five percent Japanese. Yeah, I'm thirteen percent Japanese because yeah. oh, wow. that whole invasion thing, you know. Yeah, like, I know. You know, it's raping happened. and pillaging and that <laughs> stuff, that bad stuff. So uh, we did a, a piece on um, Vietnam, and there was a psychological campaign that was them taking um, pieces of equipment, audio tape equipment recording uh, Vietnamese actors and actresses, getting that, the information, um, and, and in this case, it was their culture, where they believed in ghosts. And they went out into the field, and they played these voices of ghosts telling the enemy, you need to go home. Playing the ghost of a daughter. This is Vietnam? Or? This is Vietnam. Yeah, I, I heard about this story. We Very talked about profound. it before. Yeah, wandering soul. It, it backfired. It, it backfired because the people in placing it were so freaked out <laughs> that they started disaffecting off the uh -huh. battlefield, and and you know they, they it was effective, and they they did a uh, they used a uh, tiger <sighs> a, a a roar from a tiger, and they had a hundred and fifty Vietnamese north in this case North Vietnamese disaffect the communists wow. disaffected and left their guns in place and and evaded. They did the same thing with the ghost thing, but it backfired because both sides in the culture, just like a religious or ideological uh, ideological uh, campaign, it affects both sides. It's crazy. The, the, Black the, magic. the recordings were wailing voices yes. saying, I should have never. Th so in their culture, they believe that if you're not properly buried, yeah. you're doomed to wander around aimlessly. Wandering soul, yep. Yeah, so mm. these, exactly. these voices are heard in the forest saying, I should run while you still can, leave before it's too late or you'll be wow. trapped here like yeah. I am. They're and getting like, chills now. It's yeah, like I am too. little girl voices <laughs> from yeah. Vietnamese little girls Gosh. that were saying, Daddy, please, 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 don't go home, go home. <laughs> oh, and they were like, dude. and this the middle of the night triple uh, canopy jungle and you're like what is that and you hear it and dude is dude that would work that would work on anyone, anyone. Yeah. It would, <laughs> anyone. <laughs> is it because the, the allied troops didn't know that it was happening so they thought it was real as well or did they know and they were still freaked They're, out they, they knew but they didn't know most psychological campaigns like this are classified right this was declassified uh, years later they have a time stamp on it but when they were emplacing it and they played it they thought I assume they thought that this was actually recordings of Ghost, and they were just emplacing it, and somehow the Americans got a hold of it. But they were using indigenous forces. They were using yeah. the local nationals to put the stuff in so they wouldn't be part of the operation, actually. But I think there's just no way for everyone to know it was an operation. So yeah. if you have you know 10 local Vietnamese helping you, but there's 100 within a few miles who end up hearing it, and they start spreading the word. Farmers, the, the oh, local yeah. civilian populace started hearing it as well, and they were leaving everything. So even the support that potentially the good guys were depending on, everybody was abandoning. I kind of feel like they should have rolled with it because it prevented death. You it know, did. If they, yeah. yeah, I mean, hey, let's end the war by just freaking everybody out, making them put their guns down. Yeah, double-edged sort of psychological game. So, but, but that's the question: like, if both sides were laying down arms and fleeing, isn't that like a better option than? But the United States wanted our guys to come with guns and start. Taking control, so sixty plus thousand Americans paid for their lives for, yeah. for that war. What a reckless war! Oh, it's horrific, yeah. man! It annihilated a generation. Well, but, but, but yeah. let, let me ask you a question. Um, when it came to Afghanistan, uh, I've I've never been a fan of it. You know, I grew up with uh, uh, the invasion, and nothing seemed to make sense, and the media lied about so much. It was used to justify so much awful stuff. When uh, when Joe Biden surrendered, and then, in my opinion, intentionally just destroyed our standing in Afghanistan, giving up Bagram. A lot of people mentioned, you know, I was like, we shouldn't have been there in the first place. I think Biden did it wrong. We got a few chat, uh, super chats where they said, should the U.S. have stayed in Korea? Should they have been involved there? And I thought that was an interesting question because I've been to Seoul and I think it's absolutely amazing. And it would not be there if the U.S. did not intervene. It would be the, the entirety of the peninsula would be under a communist boot. I'm curious as, as to your thoughts on U.S. intervention. You know, Vietnam was was senseless. It was it was crushing. We lied, Gulf of Tonkin, to get involved. But what are your thoughts on, on the Korean War? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think you know when you look at even Japan, because you know the Korean War was because of the Japanese basically were fighting over the dominance of that land from the Japanese, and we're saying, hey, 
you know, these guys owned it. Who owns it? We're going to fight for it. And we wanted to fight in China and Japan for it. And, you know, the, the Korean War spanned from 1950 to 1953. My, my dad's station on the demilitarized zone in Korea met my beautiful mother in Korea as a 19. He was a 20 something year old soldier. She was a 19 year old uh, local gal. The strongest economies in the world were Japan and Korea. Why are they the strongest economies? Because of the, the stable environment we were able to set with the security provided. The problem with Afghanistan is we didn't provide that security. So when you look at where we are, even in Iraq, where we, we maintain a signature there, when you pull the plug on all support, which is what we did. I mean, my buddy Tim Kennedy and a group of uh, of merry men yep. uh, volunteered with Save Our Allies with with uh, Chad Robichaud and the Mighty Oaks Foundation and went in and extracted thousands of American civilians and Afghans Amazing. that worked with us. Yep. I, I did two rotations of combat to Afghanistan, and it's disgusting how we pulled the plug on those men, just like we did in Vietnam. We did the same exact thing. We don't learn the histories uh, or the history of, of failure, which we did in the military on both sides, and it was a, it was a problem. It was a huge I've, problem. I've heard that uh, we could have succeeded in Vietnam. I don't, I don't, I'm not a history buff or any of this stuff, but I was watching some documentary talking about when the U.S. decided to pull out and that there were, there were moves they could have made. Oh, Ho Chi Minh was trained by the Office of Strategic Service. He was trained by the CIA originally. <laughs> and then And basically disaffect, we, we disaffected him because we didn't want an alliance between him and the French. And, and we let him do his thing, which meant going to war with Ho Chi Minh. And so 1958 to 1975, that entire span of war cost a lot of American lives lives because we didn't have the proper strategy. And you know what it is? I think it has a lot to do with turnover. Uh, the government and the military has a high turnover rate where you might implement a strategy and even individual tactics on the battlefield. You'll do your time. The next guy comes in and goes, well, I need to make my impact on the world. Well, yeah. I need to have an officer evaluation report that says that I did something epic. And we continue this momentum until the end of Afghanistan. We're like, what the hell are we doing here? I've lost, got, I lost buddies of mine at the tail end of Afghanistan. And at that point, I said to myself, even early on in Afghanistan when I was there, was like, this is for a just reason. And then I was like, what the hell are we doing here? Why did we lose that guy? Amazing yeah. American, why did, we do, why did we do that? Well, that's that's the thing. People talk about how, you know, the US has maintained a military presence in South Korea, maintaining its security. And I'm like- Germany too, since yeah, 1941. Germany. Germany. Yeah. The Korea thing's a little different though. There's an active war. You yeah. know, you've got You've got outright communists, You've got people in North Korea starving. They're 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 in a in an actual cult reality where they believe insane things, and then you have South Korea. So I actually got to interview this uh, group of New Zealanders who they like to ride their motorcycles on on famous uh, uh, I guess journeys. So they did the Silk Road, right? They were mm. all around the, they did they went around I think like South America along the coasts, and then one thing they really wanted to do was go from North Korea to South Korea, and they wondered if it was possible. Well, New Zealand is like, no one's got a problem Neutral with New Zealand. Company, yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. So when they reached out, so th this, this might come as a surprise to people, it was actually North Korea that wanted it to happen. Hmm. North Korea said, please do this trip because it's good PR for us. South Korea didn't want it to happen because it was good PR for North Korea. They eventually figured out how to do it, how to, how to negotiate it. And I think the story was, it's been a decade since I interviewed them, it was back when I was at Vice, was that they were told by the Americans and the South Koreans, like, don't, don't come. And then they came anyway and said, look, we're going to be at the DMZ. You better accept us. And they were like, uh, what do we do? And here's the amazing thing. They said, when they entered North Korea, they had a government uh, escort. And they, they drove through these towns and everyone would wave to them. Everybody knew who they were and that they were coming. Like The government made sure everybody was like, they're going to come. We're going to bring them through. Everyone's going to stand here at this time and wave. And it's like kind of freaky story. When they made it to the DMZ and crossed over, there was no way to get motorcycles through this place. They said once they came on the other side, they were escorted by the press. That was the difference between North and South Korea, the government mandating it and the free press rushing there by choice to wow. try and cover it. Yeah. So I bring that up because I wonder if we, we, we maintained that, uh, if, if we had a universal attitude towards never intervening in anything ever, would South Korea be a hellish dictatorship? And is it, and is it worth it? I mean, I, look, my, my family left before, and it was partly because of rising tensions, my, my, my grandparents' family. That's my understanding. I could be wrong. Um, so I'd still be here, but I'm, I'm just, I'm curious as to your thoughts in that, in that regard. I mean, if, if Afghanistan 
if we were able to maintain a presence in Afghanistan, could it have turned out to be something like Seoul where? Yeah, I, I think the number one priority for any country to gain its sovereignty back, if it, you know, if you look at old pictures from the 70s and 80s of Afghanistan, it was a very modern society. I mean, you, in Kabul and Kandahar, there's like convertibles and women were wearing their hair down. It wasn't this radical thing that we look at now with Sharia law in Afghanistan. So the presence alone of security is what would maintain a jumping point for us to conduct those supported counterterrorism operations to suppress all of the things, all the guys that wanted to come in. We They just dropped the bomb on Zawahiri um, on his balcony yeah. and supported by the Taliban in the Afghanistan. The shredder it was called or whatever? Yeah, and it, well, it's like that was the win because he was he was uh, Osama bin Laden's 2IC. He was his second in charge. I sat on checkpoints in 2004 and 2005 trying to capture this guy. And he was, uh, we, we everybody assumed he was dead. He shows up all of a sudden because he's celebrating his freedom supported by the Taliban. And it's like, what are we doing? Like the most bizarre thing that, that I heard when all this was going down and Tim and Chad were, were activating, they had, they had messaged me about it, uh, Nick, all, all these guys, amazing men. When I heard that we had outer containment on that airfield provided by the Taliban, I was like, what, what it, did a general on TV just say outer containment was being provided by the Taliban? Did he say that? <laughs> Did he say our enemy is literally providing security on the outer containment? Oh, what happened a few days after that? Oh, uh, a, an IED went off and killed 13 Americans. Wow. It's insane. It, like it, All we needed is to maintain the airfields, the bases, right. and then that would be enough to suppress the terrorism. This, Ian's, Ian says it every single time that Biden surrendered it. Completely. Yeah. yeah. Completely surrendered. It, and and it, it gives me chills in a bad way because we had all the opportunity there. And I, I I got one of my guys out with Save Our Allies who helped me. So thank you so much, Save Our Allies, who worked with me and American forces for decades. And we were willing to abandon him. His brother who worked for us was killed and executed by the Taliban. We were willing to commit their entire lives um, and to, to wasteland knowing that they helped us because we completely pulled the plug with no excuses. Now they're the most capable fighting force in the world as a terrorist organization, which yeah. they are. They're Taliban. still a, the Taliban. And then partly because we surrendered, what, $800 billion mostly worth Mostly because we, we did that. I mean, look, night vision is the scary thing for operators going into warfare, right? You do a deliberate operation, direct action hit. You go in there with confidence knowing, hey, these guys can't see us. We, we own the night is the idea. Now they have thermal infrared flare systems on Insane. pods to be able to track all of that and that's scary for uh for any friendly force that's going into harm's way I, I you know part of me felt like it was punishment for the for the anti-interventionist for the trump supporters because donald trump set, sets this time frame to exit afghanistan and then joe biden just i i, I assume it was intentionally screwed the whole thing up some speculation was that by screwing up so bad it would create a justification for a return instead of just maintaining a security presence, or at least when Bagram was being abandoned, give a phone call to the security forces, be like, hey, you might want to go to the, the air, air Force uh, or the air, air Base right now. Instead, looters showed up. Yeah. That, that I cannot imagine was an accident. Yeah. That you abandoned in the middle of the night without telling your partners in the security forces in the country. It fell apart so fast. I just, it, it seems deliberate. Yeah, one one of the things that is a problem that happened because I've I've planned non-combatant evacuations for Mali, for Libya. I spent a year in Libya working with the uh, the agency, but also working for the military. When you do a non-combatant evacuation order, you go through a deliberate planning process. What was what happened was the State Department, a foreign service agency, was giving given the ball on running that plan. The State Department can't plan a retirement party overseas, let alone a deliberate operation to evacuate innocent people. So the military specialty is that, Special Operations Command. SOCOM has the authority in combatant command theaters, which includes Afghanistan, to do these kind of operations. And they, they train for it, I train for it, we do it for a living. And they handed it to the State Department and said, you lead it, you do it, and they didn't do anything right. It's yeah. one of the reasons they, why they failed. They handed it. Is it Biden? Was it Biden that handed it to oh, the State Department? Oh, yeah, 100%. I, I mean, yeah, he gave it to the, the Secretary of State who ran the ball 
and then they drop the ball all over the, the, the country. I'm with Tim. I feel like it's like his way of uh, intentionality, like saying, oh, Trump, you want to pull out on this day? Well, here, this is what happens when you rush it, tr- Donald Trump. It's, it's, it's not just that. It's that there's, there's a longstanding you know, international policy that uh, the, the agency of the United States had, right? That they had a plan in place of like how we're handling things, and Trump disrupted the whole thing. And it kind of felt like a, like a sour grapes almost. Like, you came in and you screwed up what we were doing. So there you go. That's what you get. Well, yeah. Biden's, that's, that's, that's your Afghanistan, Trump. Yep. Biden set this September 11th deadline. I mean, it was clear that he was trying to present himself as like. He pushed the deadline from yeah, May he to did. September. Mm. So, I, you know, I kind of wonder, you know, um, there, there is. Uh, we, we saw that viral video. I think it was, um, w- was it the Taliban who got that truck from Detroit with mm-hmm. the guy's phone number on it? Yeah. And, yeah. and. So a lot of people have talked about whether or not the U.S. wanted ISIS to exist. Because under Obama, they flourish. And it was convenient because Syria was an enemy of the United States, was obstructing our plans with the Qatar Turkey pipeline. Syria, uh, I'm sorry, ISIS comes into Syria and then starts destabilizing it. Trump gets in, crushes ISIS like that. So I have to wonder if part of it is the, the United States was well aware of the problems in the Middle East, but were, were, were accepting it as a, as a benefit to the United States in the long run. Trump ending that pissed him off. Maybe they want to destabilize the region. And so this is why they turn over weapons and make tal- the Taliban as powerful as they are now. Yeah, it seems very deliberate and, and very intentional because you can't imagine that. I can't imagine that none of the generals, including General Miller, who is a freaking hero in my mind, who ran Afghanistan, who left prior to the departure of them pulling the plug, that none of those generals came to the the table and said, "Listen, what you're planning and what you're talking about is is reckless." And as soon as we saw different regions of the Taliban taking out these places as it closed in on Kandahar and Kabul, we should have changed tactics, but we didn't. And I've seen that from the State Department. Uh, I saw it in Libya. I saw it in Pakistan. The State Department is very risk adverse. There's always a battle between the intelligence community, Department of Defense, and the State Department. Because the State Department, the consulate, they're trying to maintain diplomatic relations, but their priority is supporting the President of the United States. DOD's priority is supporting the national security of the country. So it's like these things go to head and then the losers are the Afghan people. We, you know, we talk a lot about maybe there it was intentional, maybe there are reasons behind it. I want to jump to this next story, which suggests everything you've heard about the problems Trump faced may actually be a result of Trump derangement syndrome. In this tweet, Jack Basabic posted a video from the Trigonometry podcast. Shout out, guys, from the Trigonometry. Sam Harris, quote, Hunter Biden literally could have had the corpses of children in his basement. I would not have cared. This is going viral like crazy. Wow. In Since this morning, 3.3 million views. Sam Harris basically says that the, the uh, what, what he calls a left-wing conspiracy to suppress information to try and stop Trump from winning the presidency was acceptable and good. It was warranted. And Constantine's like, I, I, I have to stop you. You're saying you're okay with this manipulation to prevent someone from winning a Democratic election. And Sam Harris is like, yep. Well, he actually tracks back and says, no, 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 I, 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 I didn't, you know, I stutters all the time. Like, let's, let's, play I, let's, yeah, play let's, let's play it, let's play it, let's play it. Let me make sure I always have the audio set to the wrong setting. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Point, Hunter Biden literally could have had, had the corpses of children in his basement. I would not have cared, right? It's like, it's, there's nothing. First of all, it's Hunter Biden, right? It's not, it's like, it's not Joe Biden, but even if Joe, like even the, whatever scope of Joe Biden's corruption is, like if you if we could just go down that rabbit hole endlessly and and understand that he's getting kickbacks from Hunter Biden's deals in Ukraine or wherever else, right, or China, it is infinitesimal compared to the corruption we know Trump is involved in. It's like it's like it's like a firefly to the sun, right? I mean, like there, there's just. It doesn't even it doesn't even stack up against Trump University. Let me pause you right there, Sam. Let me just say something right now. Trump University, Trump University. So so Trump launched university and may have uh, his argument defrauded a, a, a handful of people into giving up some cash. And he's comparing that to Hunter Biden on the board of Burisma, Joe Biden's quid pro quo, the war that has erupted and is spreading across the country, the people who have died and lost their cities. Joe Biden sending billions of dollars to the Ukrainians. So when you're saying like maybe he's getting kickbacks, you know, I don't know who cares what's in the laptop. It is entirely possible that Joe Biden's hunter entanglements are what's exacerbating this conflict. 
and you think Trump University is so much worse. This is the point I'm trying to get to. Trump derangement syndrome is so intense in these people's minds. What Sam is saying makes literally no sense. If Trump really is the con man they think he is, he's conned some American people out of their money, some property owners, and sure, that's bad. But Joe Biden is conning the entirety of the country to the world and putting us in a very, very precarious and dangerous place with his inability to do his job. And if Hunter Biden really is involved in, say, Chinese private equity deals, our security is compromised well beyond Trump ripping off some fat woman who bought a university ticket. I'm sorry, man. Sam Harris, this stuff, this stuff lights me up. Let's play more. Right. Trump University as a story is worse than anything that could be in, in Hunter Biden's laptop. Insane. In right. What? Now, that's Medium not disagree. that doesn't answer the people who <laughs> say it's there's there's unfair. images of Hunter Biden in the buff with family members, young minors yeah. that have been released from this. He's, there there is. He shares his bank account, his phone number with his dad, according to some reports. He calls his dad a pedo. And Trump University is worse than anything. Right, let's play more. To not have looked at the laptop in a timely way and to have shut down the you know the new york post's twitter account like that that's a, just a conspiracy that's a left-wing conspiracy to deny the presidency to donald trump absolutely it was absolutely right but i think it was warranted right and I'm, and again it's a coin toss as to <laughs> whether or not honesty, Sam, i'm sorry that particular piece i'm, I'm really yeah. sorry I, I was the one that said we should move yeah, on yeah. but you've just oh, said yeah. something i really struggle Go with for there which is the, you the, support the, kid, the kids in the basement you, no, no, <laughs> fuck yeah. the kids in the basement. <laughs> I'm interested yeah. in democracy. You're saying you are content with a left-wing conspiracy to prevent somebody being democratically re-elected as president. Well, no, I, I'm content. Well, so it's, but the thing is, it's just not left-wing, right? So Liz Cheney is not left-wing, right? Oh, man. Liz Cheney You're is doing everything in her power. You're content with a conspiracy to prevent somebody no, being democratically it's not like a, No, but there's nothing, conspiracy, it's not, it, it was a conspiracy out in the open, it does, but it doesn't matter if it was, a, it doesn't matter what part's conspiracy, what part's out in the open. I mean, I think it's like, if people get together and talk, and talk about what should we do with, about this phenomenon, you know, if, if it's like, if there, if there was an asteroid hurtling toward Earth, and, and we got in a room together with all of our friends and had a conversation about what we could do to deflect its course, right? Is that a conspiracy? You know, like some of the- Like that last 20 seconds was absolute Walk flubber. Oh like he's gosh. not even yeah. making any sense. Together. He said it was a left-wing conspiracy to make sure that Donald Trump didn't get democratically elected and he was fine with it. That's what he said. And, and then he walked it back and said, no, it wasn't a conspiracy. And it wasn't left-wing. Like he just said it, he just said it. Sam, this is an uh, this is an example of intelligence without wisdom. The guy s- goes on these logical tirades, which have no emotional integrity. No, no, like the 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 saying is, intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. And I think is right on from from Ian. It's it's the right point. Sam Harris is an intelligent guy, yeah. but he's he's it's it's. It's like it's a lack a lack of emotional control to say something as insane, wrong on moral and factual points is just like this is the danger. I mean, Sam Harris is a very high profile guy with a very large audience, and he is a guy who goes out and talks about the zealotry of religious groups and how dangerous it is. And then look at what he says. There's no rhyme or reason to anything he was just saying other than he's an authoritarian who would use by any means necessary powers to crush people he doesn't like. I think what strikes me the most is his last metaphor. If there was an asteroid coming to Earth and we made a plan to stop it, that would be okay, right? That's not a conspiracy. Like, he is so convinced that what's happening with Trump is just this uncontrollable, unpredictable force. He can't accept the fact that people think differently than he does and they want Trump to be in office, that they don't agree with his perspective, and therefore he has, the, it's bizarre. The whole thing he said was mishmash nonsense. Mm-hmm. Like like you mentioned, like the, the last 20 seconds flubber, walking back, changing what he's saying. He's, it's, this is, Constantine, it, 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 the trigonometry guys, they have values, they have principles, they're, they're in, in, inquisitive, they're trying to understand things. And this was brilliant this is what real journalism is. This is not, we don't get this from Brian Sutter. We don't get this from CNN. Mm. This is him just literally saying, okay, you've made your point. This is my question to you. And then he sends Sam Harris into a into a spiral of nonsense. Yeah. I mean, what they think Constantine does the best is he has a specific thesis he's trying to answer, which is like, what can you do to defend democracy? Where do you draw the lines between what is acceptable and what is not? And 
I don't think Sam Harris has the moral compass to say like, oh, yes, I respect how democracy works. Like for him, it doesn't matter. But, 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 but what's what do you think is causing this Trump derangement syndrome? Like, look, I understand Trump says mean things and you might be like he lacks decorum. But to <coughs> this degree, like I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, like he said, this dude's very intelligent. I mean, he's super intelligent. I, I appreciated him up until you posted this on your Twitter feed. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's crazy. Because it, it, it seems very deranged. But I think a lot of that is caused by him living in an echo chamber. He lives in a bubble in an echo chamber. He's used to hearing the same people talk about the same things. And just as he refers to the asteroid hitting the Earth, like that's what he's correlating his argument to. Like the worst case scenario in the world you're comparing it to that. What I what I think is fascinating, like you mentioned, is these two guys are actually being journalists. Like, and this is surprising because it's like, what is this thing called? Like, you know, objective reasoning on, through <laughs> journalism. Like, they're actually having a conversation, and he's willing to confront Sam Harris on this and catches Sam Harris off guard, which I love because, like Ian said, as soon as he catches them off guard, yeah. he starts going down a a drain. And he knows he's, he's circling the drain. He's probably killing time. He's looking at the clock. He's like, oh, crap, I don't know what to say You know, here. You know what this is? Sam said the quiet part loud, not, re not realizing that he would be challenged. And that I think what Sam said is what he truly believes in his heart of hearts. Yes. Yeah. But that is not something you can say right now when you're trying to maintain this, you know, principled position of opposing authoritarianism. No, he is an outright authoritarian, as so many of these anti-Trump mm -hmm. people are. What's the what's the what's the big it's crazy. I see these people on Facebook saying, you know, Trump's a fascist, far right authoritarian. And so and they're saying the same thing about Ron DeSantis. And I'm like, what have they done? Trump wouldn't even bring in the military to stop the rioting. We watched the rioting go on all over the country. And Trump said, well, I can't. Man, I'm sure a lot of people wished he was more fascist and would have would have stopped this rioting. He didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Then you get Antifa going around and where is that accountability? They get propped up by the media and the corporations. They get defended. They get defended by CNN. There's a, there's a compilation Daily Wire put out. Chris Cuomo is like, the problem is not, you know, the rioters. The problem is what made your fellow man have to go out and riot or something like that. And it's like, no, no, dude. These people are going around and there's no rhyme or reason to what they're destroying. This is exactly it. Sam, th there, there was that viral tweet where a guy was in Beverly Hills and he was cheering on the riots. And he was like, yeah, riot, woo. And then later on, he tweets like, why are you coming to Beverly Hills? Stop, don't come here, go downtown. No, no, what are you doing? Mm. Yeah, they love it when they're watching these people destroy other people's lives. Yeah. But when it turns to them, Jimmy Dore, I think I, I, think I have a tweet from Jimmy Dore. Up. Jimmy Dore tweeted, quote, I'm for censorship if it helps my side politically. I mean, I just can't see a downside to thinking like this because I don't read history and I'm super smarter than you. Bravo, Jimmy. See, I'm stuttering like Sam. He, 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 didn't, didn't, he, he didn't write, say exactly how, how, how Sam, right, would say it, right? He likes to do that right, right, yeah. right? Like, you agree with me? Agree with yeah, me? Yeah, he needs are you the in my cult? And I think that's probably because he's surrounded by people who are like, no, of course we have to ignore yeah. the laptop. Smart, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Like that's the only way to stop the asteroid because that's what they equate Trump to. I think that he isn't used to being pushed back. I think maybe he would have like I I don't know if this happens on the show that often, but I think there are people who go on and expect to be interviewed in a very positive sort of softball way. They expect people to be like, oh yeah, I get what you're saying. That makes sense. Thank you so much for being I... here. And I really, you know, I applaud Constantine for being like we have to return to the thesis, which is that you would be willing to like circumvent democracy. Yeah. Let's uh, let's get to the meat and potatoes here on this story, though. Civil war. Oh, yeah. Right. What's the possibility? We have this from Project Veritas. DHS whistleblower leaks new joint intelligence bulletin on domestic violent extremists set in wake of Mar-a-Lago raid. I mean, this is crazy stuff here. DVEs. Information contained in this intelligence bulletin is for official use only, blah, blah, blah. Project Veritas released an, a leaked document today from within the Department of Homeland Security, which shows how federal agencies are reacting to a recent raid of Trump's Florida home. Mm. Considering the Trump derangement syndrome of people like Sam Harris, and then we learn about people in the federal government who are saying things like this. My concern is that Sam Harris's level of derangement exists within the DHS, and this is going to make things 
dangerous. So I know this is the report that uh, that that uh, smeared you. Do you want to give us a breakdown of what what happened? Yeah. So Project Veritas drops and leaks this document, which is sent to like all special agents. Right. It's like a. Think about it like a memorandum or an updated pamphlet to educate your special agents in the field. It's not supposed to be disseminated outside of the institution, outside of their portal. So they get this, and it's an educational piece to inform, like, what are the new trends? And this one says both militia and domestic violent extremists, which they use both of those terms. And then it has a whole bunch of different pictures of different organizations, including my organization, American Contingency, which is is pretty crazy. I, again, I started American Contingency with this idea of bringing community and people together. That idea stemmed from uh, a a Seattle experience where, if you remember, uh, uh, what is the, the name of the uh, town? It was uh, the fake little town that in Seattle they stood up. Chaz. Chaz. Chaz, Chaz. Chaz yeah. <laughs> so it was supposed to be a, a, a utopian uh, uh, it universe for everybody to flourish and then it turned quickly into a socialist safe haven because they had uh, uh, armed uh, guards they had checkpoints checking IDs and and it didn't work out for anybody so now they that, killed people yeah and when that happened they started migrating and then peaceful protest turned into violent extreme protest and for the first time it came out that people who are law-abiding citizens said we need help from the police now, my company, Philcraft Survival, we teach this idea, you are your own first response. Because it, whether it's breaking your leg in the middle of a UTV trail, um, a natural disaster, man-made disaster, you're gonna be the first on scene. Know how to treat injury, know how to respond, know how to do something. So that's our educational platform. Well, when they didn't respond, because they the politicians told the police, do not respond, because the political climate won't support this, don't respond, they put law-abiding citizens in harm's way. Yep. And I said, we're gonna do something about it. AMCON, American Contingency. Now what happened, because I talked to Veritas, I talked to all these guys, what happened is a special agent within the FBI saw that we started this militia organization, which we are listed as a militia. And this organization, which they labeled, has a low uh, history of violence. They called, they said, my organization has a low history of violence. We have zero history of violence. On January 6th, people actually asked me in the organization, we're talking 100,000 people. They asked me, Mike, what are we gonna do here? I said, it's easy. We're gonna, I'll release a statement and I'll give you the guidance. And and I, I hated even being that, but I was I knew I represented as a, as a speaking head, kind of the guidance for the organization. I said, listen, group leaders, what, we're not gonna do anything. It's a protest that potentially could be dangerous. What we are gonna do is report all of the things that would benefit people on the outskirts of this protest so we can give them force protection measures and intelligence and information so they could protect themselves. So we could say, hey, the crowd is moving into X neighborhood. Be sure that you're aware, lock your doors, protect your family. That was the number one objective. To be called a violent uh, militia and extremist by both the public, which is not surprising, who's miseducated and misinformed, but then by the government on top of that, in the same week, by the way, the government called us a militia violent extreme group. The leftists called me a white nationalist and a racist, which is fascinating because I have black, Mexican, Korean, white in my same family. You're, you're literally a mixed race person. Mixed race person. And then the far right called me a bootlicker because I reported that I even cooperated with the FBI um, during this time period, not during January 6th, but we had a guy who, who said he was gonna shoot up some innocent people. I am a law-abiding citizen. You come into my public forum in my business in my group and say you're gonna shoot and harm people, I am gonna report you to local authorities. That same person took a picture of a special agent's business card. I don't know how he got it, but he took a picture of it and posted it on our forum, which was on Locals. We originally were on Locals. In fact, Dave Rubin started Locals with the idea of getting behind a paywall protected from these social media sites that were canceling and deleting people, except we were bi the biggest platform on Locals. We were bigger than Dave you're Rubin's. Not on, you're not on Locals anymore? We, 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 once they sold, things started changing in the algorithm and we, it was too much for us to moderate because on locals you have to self-moderate. So I started seeing the woes of even social media. I'm like, how do you 
how do you keep this this talk and the negativity down? So we migrated to our own server on AmericanContingency.com. So all this happens in the same week, and I'm like, I feel like I'm living in Middle Earth. I feel like I'm a moderate, and I'm like, this is what happens when you decide that you just wanna go to work, you wanna feed your family, you wanna serve the country, and you wanna live in freedom for the rest of your days. You become the enemy of everybody on the fringes, and that's exactly what we are. But the, the fringes are almost everybody these days. It, it seems it's, that way. Here's what I say, I say, like, like Evan Hafer, who owns Black Rifle Coffee, a good friend of mine, me and him have the same social, political views on a lot of things in life because we fought war for decades. We come back from that war and experience and go, I don't want civil war. People are like, Mike's taking us to war. No, Mike Glover's not taking you anywhere. I've experienced enough of that. You don't want any of that. Yep. I've been to Africa, to the Middle East. You don't want any of that world. And so there is a big pull of this. I think it's what it's ultimately the people that are listening to you because you're not on the fringes. You're actually just logical, reasonable, and you're talking about this fringe ideology that's affecting everybody. And you just want to, with the truth bomb, you just want to live somewhere in between. But the, the, the thing I bring up, I mean, look, man, you've got the FBI right on Donald Trump. They accuse him of being a fascist. He's certainly none of these things. They've lied about him relentlessly. They've just made all the stuff up. It's becoming impossible to be left alone. And you know, my thing is, what I will say, they're going after Alex Jones with everything they have because of his influence. And they're going after Donald Trump because of his influence, because they know they can't stop him. This November, I mean, look, we just, Liz Cheney's gone. Carrie Lake just won. Brian Stelter is out. These are, these are tremendous cultural shifts in a very positive direction, which is all really good news. I'm hoping that if we maintain this trajectory, then we avoid any kind of real conflict. But when you look at the lengths that the machine has gone, even smearing you, mm. it's like, bro, you're the guy who's saying quite literally, please let me just raise my family and, and be left alone. And they're not letting you. They're, they're, they're putting this, this, this bulletin out. They're coming, you know, smearing and insulting. I, I worry this is going to escalate to something, you know, substantially worse, right? Mm. I talk about civil war quite a bit. We, we will be, here's what I, here's the prediction from, Mike Lover, who runs Phil Kraus Survival and, and does this for a living, looking at preparedness, looking at threats. Um, it's my academic experience. It's also my counterterrorism, counterintelligence experience. On During the election cycle, we will see uh, a massive disruption. And on election night, prior and after, you will see a, 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 what feels like civil war and you heavily mean, you mean in the next few months in the next few years okay because we're going to have a lead up yeah. all the social media platforms are going to start getting leverage the the troll farms from china russia north korea's influence will start affecting us like it did with blm and antifa and the election cycle and what you're going to see up is a lead up attention and 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 what you're seeing is politician pol irresponsibly weaponizing government agencies and people and what you're gonna see, in, especially in heavy populated areas, is what looks like a civil war. You're gonna see, imagine this scenario. You have Antifa and BLM who comes out like they did, and they start burning down the streets. Except now you're gonna have the right fringe who's gonna come out and go, we won't accept this. It's, it's not just that. Yeah. During the summer of love, locals, just apolitical people were seen standing on their street corners with, yeah. with rifles. 100%. So so then you have this, this imbalance where you have leftist extremists, right-wing extremists, and then the people in the middle just defending what they own, their families, their friends, their communities. And then all of these things are happening and then it starts bleeding into the outskirts. It starts affecting everybody. But what happens when the law enforcement officers are caught in the middle? Now, are they not supposed to defend their lives? They're in the middle of an active gunfight. So take the Rittenhouse situation and amplify that in a full skirmish where the battlefield are the streets of densely populated areas like Chicago, where you come from. So uh, you've seen V for Vendetta? Yes, yeah. I wanna just uh, just think of that scene at the end where the guy says, eventually someone will do something stupid and it shows the finger man, the cop, shoots yeah. the little girl. All of the local residents just walk up with weapons and they go after that cop and then it like camera pans up and he goes, ah, like they're no longer gonna tolerate law enforcement. I think it won't be over something like that but you'll get to the point, like you mentioned a Rittenhouse situation. We've already seen circumstances where people have beaten cops, where cops are caught in a riot, and then 
if it gets to the point where these riders are unscrupulous and just literally don't care anymore, then you're going to get a V for Vendetta-like situation. There will be a riot. The cop will come out and he'll be telling people to get away. They won't. He'll fire probably a less lethal, and then they'll just start clobbering on him. So you, you, uh, we, we often uh, talk about, particularly with people who've experienced war, you know, our, our friend Forrest Cooper mentions the people who are trained in war and who've experienced it are the ones begging you to stop because they don't want to see this happen. I've not been in war. I've been in civil conflict and unrest. So precursors too. The worst thing I've seen was people in Egypt shooting at each other with makeshift. They had these pistols that were like 12, they were, they were uh, um, 12 gauge, I think. Uh, and they would single shot, you break barrel, break action, put it in, close it, bang. And from a, a, atop the Hilton, I watched someone get shot, killed, and then their body was carried away. That was the one time in, in this reporting, I've seen someone just deliberately be killed in front of me. Not in front of me, like very relatively close, but I was high up, so I was safe. We were we were fair, we were all pretty safe. And that experience was like having covered some of the unrest, riots, fires. I was I was on West Florissant and Ferguson when they were burning down the entirety of that whole block. You drove your car down the street. The fires were so intense in your car. It felt like the fire was right in front of your face. Seeing that. And knowing that's not even warfare, I can't imagine, you know, like, I'll just ask you, like, what do you think the average person would do if they actually were, you know, forced into the fray of people engaging in a firefight in their in their neighborhood or something? Yeah. So, you know, war is a, tends to be a complex thing, but in the primal, like the ancestral version of it, it's very simple. I mean, it's very simple. It's it's violence. It's chaos. The people who are trained for war, my peer group who are trained for war, go into war with intent, meeting task, uh, purpose, and objectives. It, and so when you have that and, and you understand what that is, it, it de it's demonstrated in this idea of art of war, right? We understand how to operate in war. People who have not, who people who are so fragile, they can't change their tire, in a fender bender, they lose their mind, uh, a simple emerg uh, emergency trauma, they, they, they lose their mind where somebody actually pays for their life when something so simple could have been done. That's the world we live in because we're, we're, we're living know, in that. You know what's really crazy to me? So when I did the, uh, the hostile environment training, they had to explain to people how to apply a tourniquet and to put it over the wound. So like they did, uh, they said, okay, so we have a, a, a dummy here. He's got a bleed in his leg. And people were like, where does a tourniquet go? They would put it under and they're like, it has to go above. And I'm like, yes, otherwise it's not stopping the blood. In between the heart and the wound. Yeah, yeah I don't understand. I th that's, that's, it, it was crazy to me that people didn't understand that. We actually had one guy, when they showed a video of a femoral bleed, he, he fainted. And then I was just thinking to myself, like, what would have happened to this guy? You know, he's in his neighborhood. Violence, war, conflict breaks out. We're in such a safe era here in the United States. If he saw... A, 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 a modicum of the violence that our troops had experienced, he'd be on the battlefield and he'd look down and just collapse. Like that to me is just, it's just bonkers. Yeah, we, I, I did, you know, I deployed all over the world um, in Yemen, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Pakistan, Libya. And a lot of the things that people deal with in those countries, they deal with because that's the way life is. A byproduct of freedom is complacency. And it always has been because we optimize our life in this democracy and this sovereignty, and it makes our life really easy, but it also makes us very weak. And there is a very specific percentage of the country from my peer group who knows what warfare is, and then there's the rest of society. One of the reasons we started Philcraft Survival is to teach civilians about worst case scenarios, because if you train for the worst case, you're prepared for everything in between. Don't train for the best case, train for the worst case. The crazy thing to me is, uh how to con convey that experience of actually watching, uh, you know, violence and trauma to an individual so they understand why it's so important to to be prepared, to to under to like, uh, look, there was a story about a club, a fire broke out, and everyone immediately ran to the door, mm -hmm. and they all jammed themselves in it, and then I think like people died, and there's a video where a guy, when everyone's running and screaming, calmly walks to the to the fire exit in the back next to the stage and just walks out. You know, I've always done this my whole life, and maybe it's because my dad was a Marine, but or as a firefighter, actually. And he would say, no matter where you are, no, when, whenever you go into a building, wherever you are, know your exits. And so my whole life, like we'd walk in, I'm a little kid, and he'd be like, where's a fire exit? And I'd look around, like, it's right there. And he goes, you got it. 
And then I hear these stories of people who are so unprepared and so complacent. They don't even understand how to leave a building when the smoke alarm goes off. Let me tell you a story, man. I worked for Fusion, which is the ABC uh, Univision joint venture. It no longer exists. I'm in the New York office. And it was a really, really nice office. They, they had desks. And then they also had these little diner chairs they had set up. So you could sit in a comfy little chair to table with your friends and talk. And so I'm sitting there with my computer and I'm with um, one, my, my producer who was working with me. All of a sudden, the bright lights start going off. Wah, 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 full blast. I grab my computer and the plug. I put under my mouth. I, I get up, jump out of the table and I look over and she's just sitting there. I'm like, come on, let's go. And she's like, what? I'm like, the alarm's going, let's go. And then she grabs her stuff. And then I look over at everybody. I'm like, yo, let's go. And there's 50 people just sitting there. all look at me. And then I'm like, I ain't waiting. I get out of the building. We were on like the third floor. I go outside. I'm standing outside. I get asked like, do you, what's going on? I'm like, the fire alarm went off. You get out of the building. What do you? And then nobody else came out. Fire trucks pull up. This is in New York. Two trucks pull up. All the firefighters jump out, run inside. And then a few minutes later, one by one, the employees all start walking outside going like, what's happening? What's happening? And then I was like, did you guys seriously stay in the building when the, when the fire alarm went off and you're on, it was like a five-story building or something like the third floor. Turns out there was some kind of gas leak or, or fire threat. And it's just remarkable to me that these people were so comfortable, the fire alarm literally did not persuade them to get out of the building. That's what scares me when we talk about all of the stuff, the potential for conflict, is that I have witnessed people sit in a building with the fire alarms going off full blast. Before this happened, this is crazy, we were in a different building. The power goes out. The speakers go on. This is an, uh, there, an emergency situation has arisen. Remain calm. Stay in the building. And I was like, nope. And I got out of the building. Everybody else stayed. Turns out there was a there was a leak in the basement that had made contact with an electrical system, caused a short, huge fire risk, and they didn't want anybody rushing to the doors and panicking and leaving. So they all just sat there using battery power on their laptops, and I left the building and went to a cafe to work. I just, I've seen so much of this, man. I was in Ferguson. I'm with the guy. He's a, he's a veteran field reporter. He's, he's fired fully automatic guns. He's been in war and conflict. He's got legit body armor. And... They make the announcement that uh, uh, Darren Wilson will not be indicted or something like that. And then all of a sudden, we hear bang, 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 bang. I'm on the ground. I look to my right. Dude's on the ground. And I'm like, my man. I look to my left. And there's a guy from ABC standing there looking around going, those, those fireworks? And I'm like, get down. And then he's like, what's happening? I was like, do you see anybody with fireworks? No. Do you see guns? Okay, dude. It's crazy to me, man, when... You're put in these situations, and I'm not even talking about war. I'm like, just street violence, riots and stuff. But to see how people act when this stuff goes down. I imagine like in the heat of the chaos, there's very little you can do to convince un uneducated people about it. So is this why like you're doing this now? So people ahead of time, like I was thinking last night, like, okay, just I've been thinking, I've been in emergency mode for like weeks. It just strikes me like, what if there's an active shooter? What if there's a fire? I, I, I should have a plan with my neighbors, with my environment. So what are what steps from from start to finish if someone were to experience like an emergency, a life threatening emergency? Yeah. So all the things you're describing when we talk about worst case scenarios, whether it's natural, man made disaster, has to do with stress. They're all like like a a catastrophe is actually a stressful event, just short in duration of time, but elevated in the actual volume of stress that you get. So a lot of people aren't prepared for mild stress. And you know, I make the joke like, if your girlfriend texts you and says, "Hey, I saw you liking those girls' uh, uh, yoga pants videos on Instagram," how do you react? <laughs> a lot of people are like, "Oh, what are you talking about?" And they get angry and emotional, and they don't know how to react. Their palms sweat, and that overreaction is a correlation to high grade stress. How you're going to react to high grade? So a lot of people in our society, they use groupthink as a psychology tactic, which they don't know they're doing, but it's like, if that person's not moving, why would I move, right? So we're all sheeple, right? We're just not doing anything. So the idea is like, identify the threat, observe, pay attention to what it is, but like Tim said in, in a couple of examples, physical displacement from the X or the crisis is the best way to survive. So break your physical body up and away, create distance, time and as many obstacles as you could put in between. But because we're curious, we wanna catch, catch everything for the gram, we're like, what is that noise? Is that firecrackers? Let's walk out with the phone and catch this on my story on Instagram and then get potentially shot in the face. Not, not yeah. just that, but I've seen these veteran journalists, they do no training and they go into hostile environments 
and they put everybody at risk. Yes, it happens mm-hmm. all the time. I've yeah. seen it too. I've seen it at live in war with journalists that were with oh, us. Man. Sebastian Younger is a good example. His One of his best friends who was a cinematographer on Restrepo when he went was hit by an RPG in Libya and killed. Not saying they did the wrong thing, but that's that's the potential risk to your life. Our society is very fragile, very weak, and if you're not getting prepared now, then you should be. When you say uh, make distance and time from the X, from the tragedy, or from the, uh, what, the uh, I guess, emergency, are you saying like, phys- so this is a fire, you want physical distance, but you also want, when you say time, what is that, like you want water that'll make the fire take longer you to get wanna to you? You wanna create, in the distance, which is correlated to time, you wanna create a gap space in getting off the X. The, the proximity, which a lot of the indications of a catastrophe, we sense, obviously, we through sound, smell, taste, whatever it is, we, we feel it, even intuition. We're like, hey, something might be wrong. Follow your intuition. One of the pre- reasons why so many people are getting killed is because we're complacent, but that relates to our laziness. It's like the idea of like, you're in bed watching Netflix with your with your spouse. You hear a loud noise downstairs. What do you immediately do? You write it off. You're like, oh, that's probably the cat. Uh, honey, we don't have a cat. Oh, it's well, it's the neighbor. Well, uh, house is it, settling. It, the house is settling. Get off your ass and physically assess the situation. So if you hear fireworks, oh, that's fireworks. If it sounds like gunshots, start moving and then figure it out on the on the on the on the way out, and then read about it on the news. But yeah. don't take the chance that something's going to happen. And then that's that's obviously the first part. The second part is the technical proficiency you need. And then also the inoculation of stress. Most people forget that. Like if I teach you to apply a tourniquet, it take you three minutes. I mean, it's not hard. You got a pen. Yeah, it, it's it, a pen, a belt, material, an actual tourniquet that costs twenty nine ninety five on philcraftsrival.com. It's not expensive. <laughs> um, but you get that tourniquet. What we're forgetting in technical proficiency is there's this inoculation, suppression of stress, which means you're likely gonna be in a sympathetic nervous response, fighting and flighting. Your body primarily wants to move. So you have to be able to technically react and do those things while under stress. We don't have anything in our society besides jujitsu, uh, combat sports, um, sports period, that allow us to do that. But what are we seeing? We're seeing woke, culture making us more soft because it's everybody gets to participation yeah, one, one thing that uh stuck with me for a long time is this story i read a, uh, I, I was told when i was younger somebody in my neighborhood these these guys got into a fight some guys beat up some guy a few days later you know a guy b beats up guy a a few days later guy a's friend c guys b and they run up and start wailing on him mm. and then all of a sudden in the middle of the pummel one of the dudes pulls out a knife and goes one two right in the chest of the dude they're beating up The other two guys go, whoa, whoa, dude, dude, and pull him back. Like, what are you doing? Like, we were just beating him up. They ask the guy, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. And he gets up and runs, turns the corner, drops dead. Mm. They hit his lung. Yeah. And it was crazy when uh, uh, I learned about sucking wounds. I think that's right, right? How simple it would have been to save that guy's life. Mm. Relatively simple. I mean, I I don't know. uh, I'm not an expert on how to. I, I know you can do the trick with, like, plastic wrap and tape on three sides. But couldn't they have just like he could have like stuck his finger in it or plugged it or something and well it's uh, so your your, ca- your chest cavity your chest wall is very it's very f- fragile to say the least you take a puncture wound in the chest you're going to collapse a lung because the negative pressure in your lung collapses because it, it needs that pressure what you're doing in the chest seal is you're applying it to that laceration where you've been compromised in, in your chest cavity and it's re-establishing the balance in, in that pressure. What sounds like to me that situation is he hits something in, that's vital. So he hit something in the the pump house. He might have nicked an artery, bled internally, which in in that case he would need a chest tube, or he would need you know upgraded levels of care. And there might not have been a thing he could have done for. So him. at least the story, as we were told, is that it caused a sucking wound. And so I don't, maybe my understanding of what happened was wrong. Yeah. But in that circumstance, you think it was just they couldn't do anything about yeah, it. Yeah, likely he got stuck in, in the pump house or in a major artery off of the, the branch of the heart that he bled internally. Because when you a sucking chest wound is going to help with circulation and, circulation and respiration. So when you apply that, like I've, I've treated guys in real life where the guy had been has a laceration in his chest. 
he has a sucking chest wound. He can't breathe. He's completely pale. And and then you put a, a, a piece of plastic, basically. It's got Hydra tape that's on it. And you put it on his chest, and he immediately comes back because wow. his, his lung inflates. He's like, yeah. oh, my God. Like, holy crap. That was crazy. Well, it, well, when somebody's bleeding internally, that's one of the hardest things to stop. It's it's how you kill big game, elk or deer. You shoot him in the, hit him in the chest cavity in the pump house, and you should hope to double lung them. And they bleed out immediately, dead in thirty seconds. I, I got, I got to say, man, you know, I always tell people have some emergency food, have some emergency water, mm -hmm. um, have you should have a go bag, clothes in it, all the supplies. Yep. I would, I would probably stress that people probably look into your stuff and and figure out the basics because I just watched a fight video. It's on Reddit. Dudes are fighting in the street. Everyone's laughing and, che and, and cheering, and then one guy takes a swing. Dude ducks, comes up. Returns the hook, bam, guy just hits the deck. Woman runs up to him and starts shaking his head violently. And I'm like, she's gonna what paralyze are that you guy. Doing? Yeah. It, people don't know anything about this. It's crazy watching videos so often of people, if they just were told one sentence could save a life. Mm -hmm. Crazy, yeah. man. It's crazy how simple it is. It's yeah. very simple. Yeah, you mentioned stress management earlier in jujitsu. I've often thought and been talking to people that also think that the police could benefit from taking jujitsu, at least being like a purple belt or something in jujitsu, that they could manage stress better. I hadn't thought that of combat sports as a way to, like while you were talking, I was like, oh, working out. If The more muscularly you know beat up I am, the more I'll be able to handle a fire yeah. Or, yeah. or an invasion or something. That's that's resilience. We call that resilience, right? It's the, your ability to bounce back through adversity and difficult circumstances. The best way to do that, which you know, Leah Stumpf and Andy Stumpf are good friends of mine who, who teach this through their dojo in Kalispell. The idea is when you're fighting and combating a person, I'm 240 pounds, I'm six foot one, I'm a big Asian dude, I have a, a diverse combatives background. I step in a ring with a, a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a 150 pound dude, he will pretzel roll me in half. Getting beat by another human being in a physical confrontation is very humbling because the idea that you would increase your sympathetic nervous response, get more aggressive, louder, more angry, is all the things that's gonna get you choked out faster. So you have to be calm. You have to concentrate on your breathing. You have to rely on technical proficiency. And if you don't manage your stress, you'll just get choked out. And that's the benefit of jujitsu, I think, on a massive scale, which um, uh, Andy has talked about this. Uh, all the guys that I'm uh, in, in my same circle have talked about how every law enforcement officer should be trained at a, at a minimum in jujitsu. Uh, a Grant, uh, Greg Anderson, a buddy of mine in Washington State, runs a program as a former police officer where they're training law enforcement officers to be better at jujitsu to make them prepared for what they see in the streets. So, so you're, you're trying to train regular people and all of this stuff. I mean, that sounds like it would be a really, really great thing if we had, if the, every single person in this country had basic survival skills and preparedness skills, it would make us, I mean, uh, just particularly well prepared for any kind of invasion or conflict or war or anything like that. Yeah. I, but I wonder why it is that uh, government institutions would oppose that. Well, here, here's why. You outsource everything to the government because we have this collaborative social agreement, this non-written contract. We're going to pay taxes, so we're going to outsource health care. We're going to outsource first response. We're going to outsource everything to make our life more convenient. So when you empower yourself, which is what we're teaching, we're not just teaching preparedness, we're teaching self-reliance. And that is offensive for a government who wants control and power. The, the less power they have, the more you cut the umbilical cord, the more opposed they are to that. It ha ha it's There's classic cases of it, obviously. I was going to ask if you have a lot of teachers who reach out to you, because I hate to say it, but stress management... I know obviously like we could be talking about school shootings, but even just like I went to high, a high school where we would have occasionally kids OD in the classroom. Like if you're in a scenario with unpredictable people, even if they're not inherently dangerous to you, being able to manage your response to them and know how to react in a lot of scenarios seems like a really valuable tool. Yeah, we're starting. So we're starting a kids program this year with uh, our family director of preparedness, uh, Amber. We started teaching women. And a lot of those women were teachers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those women were single moms. And they showed up and were like, why are you here? It's like, well, because we want to know how to be prepared too. Because it seems like to be like a tactical industry thing. Mm -hmm. But normal people want to know how to manage stress, how to uh, apply a tourniquet, how, how to react in an active shooting. So, you know, we were very critical of Uvalde and all the things that, that went wrong because we want to make the wrong 
right in the future. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten a huge response from teachers. In fact, my training director, uh, uh, Sean Kirkwood and Kevin Owens, who are both veteran Green Berets, they are working with our law enforcement instructors because we a Green Beret teaching um, self defense isn't the best tactic always, right? We we kill and capture bad guys. We don't we don't do the legal law enforcement thing. We we deploy these law enforcement officers all over the country to teach um, these teachers and teach these uh, resource officers how to be better prepared. And that's what we need ultimately because the superpower we are. I think the Second Amendment makes us a superpower, which makes us not Ukraine. That's why you got to subsidize Ukraine with billions of dollars and all the assets to bear. America is a superpower because of the constitutional freedoms that we have, but also our current capability. The NRA, which I am not an advocate of the NRA, outside of their lobbying to support constitutional uh, security, when you look at the NRA and why it stood up, it stood up post Civil War, 18, 1840 or 1861 to 64 Civil War. I think it stood up in 65, I might be wrong. But when you look at why they stood up, it's because they wanted to make um, they wanted to make the civilian populace better prepared to defend themselves because they were shooting flintlocks from hips or didn't know how to load it. We were a national superpower because of that. And I, I think that's ultimately what we are we, as a as a population. The more prepared we are, the better capable we are against Russia, China, North Korea, Iran. If they wanted to band together and take this country over, it'd be an easy fight. Yeah, There's was, a gun behind every blade of grass. It was 1871. Yes, 1871 is when 1871. the NRA. 1871. I think yeah. also it makes people less afraid of each other. When you're comfortable or confident in your ability to defend yourself, there's less reason to fear Donald Trump or a random guy down the street that might be armed. You know, like it's it's a lot easier to, I don't know. No, you're, you're, we, we see that on the range when people show up you have all backgrounds. It's not tactical guys showing up to our ranges. It's like mothers, fathers, uh, teenage, uh, you know, 18, 19 year old young people who want to be better prepared. When you see that and them coming together, the the second and third order effects of all this, when people come together trying to be better prepared, they start building community. And they start going, they don't, they don't go, oh, you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. They go, oh, you want to be prepared too? Like, I don't care what your background is or who you politically affiliate with. I'm on that same page. Let's do this together and protect our family. Let's learn a skill. And and that's the biggest component that we've made is this idea of bringing people together over a commonality, which is being best prepared. And it's better for you if your neighbors are prepared, especially if you have a positive relationship with them, right? Like When we grew up, I assume all of us knew what community watches were right yep. you had a community watch that would watch out for each other and you hated like the pesky old lady my dad we used to talk about her like god she's always talking about what's new what's different what changes in that environment now we live in a society where you pull up and you see your neighbor um checking his mail and you're scowling because you're like who is this like that's our neighbor honey like you know oh yeah but you know why community watch went away we had someone on the show talk about this, that if you form a community watch group, anything you do now is conspiracy. So everybody, like all lawyers are telling people, don't be involved. High don't. liability, conspiracy. Yep. Yeah, I get it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If I tell you in your bedroom, I'm like, hey, I'm thinking about starting a company. That's a conspiracy. No, 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 no. What they're saying is <laughs> if, you ever, if you're in a community watch group and then one guy goes out and someone is, is, is breaks into a building and they get into a fight and the, and the, and the, the, the burglar, the robber gets killed. They will say, if you can't justify the killing, it was a conspiracy to commit murder, and the other members of the community watch are involved. Wow. When did that start happening? Well, someone talked about it on the show several months ago. So I don't know exactly when that started happening, but that sounds like I could an see over, it. Yeah. I could see that it would be some kind of legal precedence where it increased the liability. The local district attorneys were like, whoa, 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 we can't manage this. Because like American contingency. We try to co-cooperate with local sheriff's departments because if we are the first on the scene of an accident, how can we best support and facilitate a first responder about to come in? If I if I know and I am trained how to identify a threat or identify a casualty and can facilitate a law enforcement officer who's coming in to do the rescuing or do, do the facilitation of rescue, then I am an, an asset to that community. But again, the district attorney comes in, they have a political affiliation, and they go, oh, this is too much liability. You do your job and just live in your life and let us do our job, which is controlling your life. And that's threatening. I mean, having chickens, having a homestead, growing your own food is threatening to people in this country. They said, Facebook said canning was extremist. What? 
We were we were, we were just making jelly. I got like, I deleted just... for a canning video what? because it was seen as it what? seen as extreme. Our when we started this company, every video that we did that was uh, even remotely related to self reliance was seen as extreme and it was deleted from Facebook. The people who taught me most about self reliance were my uh, step grandparents who are just like older white people from Texas who have like canning stuff and but, some horses. Yeah. Like we we uh, we grew some vegetables. We wanted we have berries. So we've got a good like three or four weeks of berry season out here. So you gotta preserve them. And you know, you gotta know how to can because if you don't do it right, it can create botulism and it can kill you when you try yeah. to eat the canned food. You gotta know how to yes. boil so the thing. Crazy, and, dude. Yeah, I love it. I geek out on the homesteading stuff. It's what, some of the stuff that we teach. But the whole idea is going to only help the government because it's less stress and strain. But if you look at what the government's tactics are, it's to create more reliance. Because if you are if you are dependent on solely on their finances, their government healthcare systems, and all the things, then they have you. They have you hooked. They have your vote because they have you hooked. Any displacement from that is threatening by by the government. Does, We're gonna. Oh, I was just gonna say, does your group get accused of like? cultivating vigilantism is that like one of the fears that we're, you guys are going to think that you're better than law enforcement 100 percent. i mean that that's the title militia that's that's as described by the government of who we are and and i and and people are like oh it's no big deal they just called you a name no when you designate somebody a name in the government that comes with authorities mm -hmm. those authorities come from lines of funding that means execution orders to do surveillance and all this other stuff so it gets more deeply seated in the weeds when they title you a militia, and we most certainly are not. We're a community of Americans that just want the best. We're gonna go to Super Chats. If you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the URL to this link wherever you can. If you really do like the show, just share the show in general, and head over to TimCast.com, become a member, because we're gonna have that uncensored members only after show coming up at 11 p.m. Let's read. We got Evan Grant who says, Tim's wrong about apps listening on conversations. I've literally run tests to have people mention products to me while my phone's out, not doing any searches, and then checking ads. I don't know what you mean about me being wrong. Are you saying that I'm wrong when I say they're probably not listening to you? It's just predicting your behavior? So you've heard people say that, like, they'll say something near their phone, and then their phone will do an advertisement for it. The claim is that they're not really listening to you, but that the algorithms can predict your behavior so well that they... Pre, you know, that it seems like they're listening to you. So the example we gave the other day is father sees a bunch of letters come in the uh, advertisements in the mail for pregnancy gear and stuff from Target to his daughter. And he's like, he calls them up like, why are you sending maternity stuff to my teenage daughter? And they were like, it just an algorithm based on what you search for. We don't know. Turns out the daughter wasn't searching for pregnancy stuff. She was searching for stuff like, why do I feel this way? Do I need, you know, nausea medicine or something? And the algorithm knew that based on the things she was doing and when she was doing it, she was probably pregnant. Because it can see 100 million women all saying the exact same things when they get pregnant. However, I will add, I was talking with, uh, when we were talking with Jack Posobiec on the show, we mentioned Book It. Book It was the old program. Remember Pizza Hut? Mm. I don't know. I, I don't know how old are you. How old are you? 42. 42. So you, you had Book It when you were a mm -hmm. kid, right? Yeah. You'd read the book at school and then you get a free donut, you get a pizza. Pizza Hut. I got an advertisement for a booking agency that, w that said book it and it was their tagline and I saw it and I was like okay that makes no sense in what context would anything I be book it doesn't exist anymore so the only thing it could show me was an ad for travel called book it mm -hmm. dude it they're listening yes. okay Google yeah. stop Alexa stop <laughs> like, those machines are listening to you I think there's one in here right now yeah it's, it's also that they figure out like if you're sharing a wireless network with someone and they're researching a topic, it will also serve those ads to your phone, right? Did like you if you're on the same network. Did anybody hear Google search book it? No. My Google so. thing is on right now, by I the way. Sorry, you just, you just told it to turn yeah, off. Yeah, I told it to stop, but I guess that's not the turn off. It was man. like, you, yes, you well, asked so, for me, hello? Isn't that my, wild? My, I can turn on your machine if you're listening to me at home. That's my, crazy. My, my point here is, Jack was talking about Pizza Hut nationalism. Have you ever heard him talk about that, Jack Posobiec? Mm -hmm. And referencing a program that doesn't exist anymore, you should not get an advertisement for it. I got an ad in big blue bold letters that said, book it. And then I was like, get out of here, dude. I don't travel. There's no reason for me 
to be, I, I, I'm, I'm here for 16 hours every day, morning and night doing this show, almost no travel. There is nothing in my search that I am doing that suggests any kind of travel. The only way this could have been delivered to me is because it was listening to me when I said book it. Yeah. And it, the, the machine assumed book it meant book the travel when I was talking about a reading program. Because there's no more reading program, the only ad it could serve me was travel. I was uh, Crazy. traveling with friends once and we all grew up in Connecticut. And if you're from Connecticut, you probably know what bean boots are, which are, they're an LL Bean product. They're just really popular. And they were telling me that like, one of my friends had gone to school in Chicago and someone had recognized her as being from New England because she was wearing these L.L. Bean boots. I have never searched for them in my life. I don't own them. I don't I don't follow L.L. Bean or anything like that on social media. My phone was in a separate room charging. I walked in the first ad at surfing was for L.L. Bean boots. I remember I was talking to someone on Facebook Messenger and then I was talking to someone in person at the time while on Messenger and then all of a sudden a little thing popped up for the ad about what we were talking about. We are talking about going to like, you know, Uno's or whatever, Pizzeria mm -hmm. Uno's. And then all of a sudden a thing popped up and I was like, People in the chat are like, Ian, you turned my TV off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, my Alexa <laughs> machine just... All right, let's, let's, let's read some more. All right, let's see. George Fratarelli says, so glad Mike is on to tell his story and also how the FBI is targeting American contingency. Hot damn. Hey, Mike, please talk about your time in the old guard and the tomb of the unknown soldier. Oh, yeah. So big shout out to uh, my buddy Khan. Had a third infantry uh, soldier who's going to ranger assessment really soon. He, he he shouted out to me and said, hey, you want to get a tour? And I had some tomb guards reach out to me and say, hey, we'll give you a tour of the quarters, which is in the middle of Arlington National Cemetery. So back when you know Sergeant Major Glover was a private, I was an E1, 17 years old. I went to the old guard as my first stint prior to 9-11 happening. This is 1997. And one of the hardest things that you could do in the military period was try out to be a guard at the Tomb of the Unknowns. So it's been guarded 24 hours a day by the Army since 1948. It's right down the road in the middle of Arlington Cemetery. It has the World War One, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam unknowns. They disinterred the Vietnam unknown because they identified him as an Air Force pilot named Major Michael Blassie. Uh, he since was uh, disinterred and buried in his home state of Missouri. And then um, I was a guard there from 1998 to 2000 prior to 9-11 happening. So... I was bad, badge holder number 470. And um, right now they're at 701 for the badge holders. It's the second hardest badge to get in the military besides the astronaut's badge. And it took me nine months to earn my tomb identification badge and was the most difficult thing that I did in the military so out of all the things I've done. What do you have to do? You have to guard the Tomb of the Unknowns on a, on a cycle or a schedule based on your relief. And there's three reliefs oh, wow. based on height. And you do that 24 hours a day seven days a week since 1948. But how do you earn the badge? Like You go through a process, so you have to you have to memorize 20 plus pages of knowledge on the on Arlington National Cemetery. There's uniform inspections. Uh, my standard will remain perfection is line six of the Sentinel's Creed. That whole methodology is ingrained into you as a tomb guard where you have to be perfect. So it, it, was, a, it was a crazy deal being so young and doing that, but it's what established my whole military career. So uh, Ian Kinney said something. I was just reading it while you guys were talking. He says, Tim, you should see what media bias fact check says about Timcast. I think you'll be upset and possibly will want to send them a letter. Uh, absolutely not. I'm, I'm, I think this is actually amazing. So uh, media bias fact check, I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They tell you if it's left or right. Um, they call us right wing at Timcast.com. I do think that's silly considering Timcast.com is like 80% not political. So it's like Cast Castle is not, Pop Culture Crisis is not, Inverted World is not, Chicken City is certainly not, I hope. They're the most political part. What are you talking it, about? It is true. Yeah, when Roberto, so uh, do you know the politics? Mm. Roberto um, was found guilty of sex crimes. Mm. So he's been sentenced to mm. the penal colony of Cocktown Ooh, with uh, yeah. 20 other roosters. <laughs> yeah. And Roberto Jr. has assumed the role of sheriff of Chicken the City. Drama. Chicken tenders. Mm -hmm. That chicken tenders. Yeah, um, but but Media Bias Fact Chick says... Factual reporting, very high. Press freedom rank, mostly free. Medium traffic with high credibility. Oh. It's fantastic. Sounds great. Yeah. yeah. But you're right wing. I mean, they can call me whatever they want. Um, it's, it's, it's weird. They're, 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 uh, they say due to story selection. Hmm. And it's like, okay, I guess. I mean, like we report on hearing aids. You know the Biden administration signed. You did that, right? That was me. Like I, I'm not sure that's right wing. We we were. I mean, I really think that our reporting is incredibly mixed, and part of that is because yeah. our journalists have a lot of interests. Like they are not in and of themselves all in one rabbit hole. I mean, 
we we kind of cover everything really. But I don't care if they. Call but again, us I think we're the coolest news site. So. Yeah. Like they, they can call me right wing. I'm not going to get mad about that. They said we were highly, highly high credibility in green, like big letters. I'm like, oh, there you go. Thank That's right. You. We are, we are, we have higher standards than NewsGuard. That's right. That is true. Yeah. Then even even NewsGuard. Yeah. Nick Koenig says, I asked Lauren today why she wasn't drinking a thousand dollar whiskey in a paper cup in her live stream. Her response: I only drink other people's thousand dollar whiskey. <laughs> Very smart. True to form. Very smart. So uh, are you familiar Lauren. with Pappy? Uh. Uh-uh. So just like a thousand dollar whiskey. Oh yeah, Pappy. Oh yeah. yes, very. Lauren familiar, Lauren yeah. Southern was here, and she grabbed a paper cup and asked if she'd have whiskey. I said sure, and she was pouring it in the cup and drinking from it, and I didn't notice. And then someone pointed out, and then I was like, Lauren, are you drinking the thousand dollar whiskey out of a paper cup? And she's like, Is that how much it is? I don't know. Like what? <laughs> all all she's of the whiskey, pe- Pappy the whiskey single handedly. Uh, the whiskey people were like, No, no, no give her Crown Royal or something. <laughs> have a Crown Royal bottle. Oh man! There was a guy who, a restaurant owner, who got so frustrated with how difficult it is to get pappy, and there's like an allotment that he started uh, giving out at cost. And then one year he gave it out as Jello shots, and then he stopped getting allotted pappy Van Winkle. Ooh, smart! All right, Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says Brian Stelter is a reliable source. Like Antifa is anti-fascist. Yep. Like abortion is healthcare. Like men can get pregnant. Like Biden is the great unifier. Like fiery is mostly peaceful. Like Tim has hair. Brilliant. <laughs> Bravo, good sir. Spicy. Yep. All right. Triton54 says, would give anything to see Mike in a room with Brandon Tatum discussing Uvalde. Everyone needs to watch Mike's take on the Uvalde response that Green Beret made this Navy chief stand at attention for 90 minutes straight. What was that about? Well, it's me calling out Uvalde. And I, I think the, the issue where they're mentioning Brandon is he was he was backing him because he's back in the blue. He's a former yeah. sheriff's uh, officer. And that's what you do when, you, when you're when you taking care of your tribe. But I consider law enforcement officers, because I train them for a living as part of my job, um, brothers and sisters. Um, and I want to make sure that I'm always doing right by them. So doing right by them means criticizing them when they're wrong. And so for 90 minutes, I went through the video that was released to the CCTV camera, had the breakdown timeline with the CCTV camera, and went minute by minute through what was right and what was 95% wrong. Where do, can people find that video? It's on my YouTube channel. On uh, the, We have two YouTube channels, the Philcraft Survival channel and uh, Mike Glover Actual. I believe that one's on the Philcraft Survival channel. Uh, it's got a couple million views, a lot of people who are heated and talking about it. But I think that's a good thing because if you could extract anything good, it's we should never make that mistake ever, ever, ever again. And it, and it also is a testament to law enforcement failures, but law enforcement successes. Because it wasn't for the BORTAC operators, whose job, by the way, is not responding to active shootings in schools. Yeah. They do border patrol and 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 react to crisis in border on the on the uh, border. They, on their own accord, went in there like heroes and got in a gunfight with a bad guy that killed nineteen kids. On wow. their own accord, because they're a part of that community, to a testament to everything you are working on. Everything yes. you call for. Yes, they they were taking care of their own community, and if it wasn't for those guys, there'd be more children potentially dead. All right, Matt Zarella says, Tim, please hire Brian Stelter and make him wash your car while dressed like Biff at the end of Back to the Future. <laughs> I get that because I watch Back to the Future. It's a little favorite. bit of humility for Brian is going to go a long way right now. I don't know. You know what? I don't know. What's he going to do? Just have some fun like, with it. He'll never. I, I can't imagine. Well, some blog, BuzzFeed will hire him, I guess. They'll he'll find like get something. a professorship somewhere. He's going to be okay. Yeah. I don't worry about him, I have to say. Matthew Velasquez says, hello, Tim. What are Mike's thoughts about the rooftop Koreans in California circa 92? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, That's a tough one, huh? Yeah, the rooftop Koreans is, you know, I, my mom and had friends who lived in L.A. at that time. Koreatown was radically um, invaded by a whole bunch of radical protesters that were violent and extreme who killed multiple people and wounded a lot of people, injured a lot of people. The rooftop Koreans were taking care of their businesses, but protecting their lives and self-defense. It's the great thing about the Second Amendment that allows you to do that before all the radical gun laws came to California. Uh, With just an interesting note, uh, I want to remind people, and you can do this research, gun control came from government institutions wanting to counter the Black Panthers in the 1970s and 80s specifically under Reagan when Reagan yep. was the president. Those laws were expanded into Texas 
And that became gun control because they were fearful of law-abiding citizens who happened to be black protesting with firearms around government buildings. And that started the snowball rolling downhill. So when you're voting for these things, when you're thinking about these things, when you look at your, your rights, just remember where that started and any of those infringements on those rights uh, started with the Black Pan the Black you know, Panther movement. One thing that bums me out with the culture war stuff is um, I tweeted something about Second Amendment, absolute, have your guns. And then I got this leftist response and they were like, yeah, but I don't hear you saying, you know, black people should have guns. Your, your position is totally fake. And I responded with, I think every single black person in this country should be walking around with an AR-15 if they so choose. And I think the Black Panther should be armed to the teeth. Mm -hmm. And then he responded with based. And then I'm, I'm like, yes, of, like, bro, like, I don't care from the left or the right. I think everybody has a right to keep and bear arms. I don't know why they assume that about us or other people's positions that like we don't want the Black Panthers to be armed. That's Second Amendment, bro. Yeah, they should all have guns. And I, like the the what is it the um, not effing around coalition? You, you know those guys? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they had some misfires, which is, <laughs> you know, come on, guys. Training is a couple accidental discharges, yeah. accidental discharges. There yeah. you go. Sorry, not misfires. But I'm like, I watched that video and I'm like, I dig it. I'm like, cool, man. They're like walking around. They're all armed. They're doing their thing. Yep. Right on, man. That's that's. They're, they're not hurting anybody. They're peacefully protesting. Ex absolutely. Yeah. Now the accidental discharges is a problem. <laughs> but but like it, it's fine to call it the accidental discharge. It doesn't mean they should never right keep in their arms. Maybe those guys who should you know maybe in, at that regard there should be you know I don't know is that it's a criminal charge right I believe right for yeah it's fire it's yeah. basically firing a, a, a firearm in public yeah 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 so look I understand that but uh, I watch these videos of these guys and they're pretty aggressive but hey man. I got no beef. Yeah, no. I was Have thinking guns, last night how badass this country is. And one of the great things is the individualism, the ability to kind of not have the state looking down your back because it's in those times of silence and solitude where you can create great things where you're not interrupted by outside forces. This is an amazing opportunity. Yeah. We'll, we'll try and read some more Super Chats. We got Martin Edgar. He says, the viewing of pictures and video of combat is nothing like actually experience, experiencing it. Being there is 100 times worse from a Gulf War and Somalia vet. Thank you for your service, Mike. 24 ID 3 CE Victory Division. What do you, uh, without, I, I want to ask you all about your experience in the war. We don't have time for that on this show tonight, obviously. But like, what was the biggest difference in the perception of what it was going to be and then what it was in reality when you were there? I, I think the effects on innocent people, right? You, you fight an insurgency, which is the most difficult thing to fight. It's not conventional forces going head to head in an open field like the Civil War. It is literally going door to door and then going, is that guy going to kill me? Is that guy a bad guy or is that an innocent person? And innocent people are affected by it. So when people talk about Civil War, what they're really talking about is an insurgency where you can't identify a friend from foe, where the person that's waving you at you friendly the, the one second is throwing a grenade into your vehicle the second. So that is very difficult to manage. And for me, the most difficult thing in my nine trips and four and a half years to war was seeing innocent children and women affected by that. Uh, the, the men, middle-aged males who were aggressively going after us in a war, free game. But you'll never be in a conclusive battle, just you and bad guys toe-to-toe. -to -toe. All of these bad guys are surrounded using them as human shields by their children and, and their women, and it's disgusting to see that. But that's the horrific side of war, I think. One of the... Uh and this is just a video I saw. One of the most brutal videos was a father holding his son who had died in, you know, street conflict. And the sound that man made, it's just like, man, you know, these, these, these uh, LARPers, these Antifa people who want a revolution are going to be the first ones crying and begging for they, they, these people who, fa who pretend to want this revolution. So as soon as they get what they want, they'll be begging for an authoritarian regime to take over and bring back stability by any means necessary. They'll, they will cry and beg. It was a mistake. We didn't mean it. We mean it. In we Russia, want they, Trump. they call it calm. They want calm. They yeah. don't talk about peace. They talk about calm. Mm. Just want to be able to walk down the street, pick up a loaf of bread, go back home and share it with your family and not have to worry about getting hit by shrapnel or an IED. Let's see. Below Few says, last night you guys talked about how infrequently men cry compared to women. I had a pretty good streak going until you started reading detransitioning perspectives on Reddit. Very powerful episode. Yeah, that was the uh, members only thing we did last night. We were talking about um, 
these issues and we pulled up the D trans subreddit where it's mostly young women talking about how they were misled and how mm -hmm. they regret this and their lives are destroyed. The terrifying thing is how some of these people are talking about taking their own lives and you know we want we want desperately to avoid all of that but we got we got dark days in this country man this you know all right kg seath says jocko willink on joe rogan said cops should be trained in jujitsu yes at what belt level do you think would be sufficient for an officer blue at a minimum so there's white and then blue which is hmm. general proficiency both top and bottom so you understand leverage and control I think at a minimum it needs to be blue, and I think the experts, including Jocko Willink, who is an expert, um, would say the same. Would you have it done like at the police academy level, or is this something that like you'd have to continuously pursue, like something with the like, fitness test? Good point. I mean, the biggest deficiency in in obviously going after defunding the police officers is budgets and constraints that are within the department. And what I tell people, as I did in the military, I wasn't a great operator in special operations because the military or the institution made me such. I went out on my own time and went to jujitsu dojos, shot competitions on the side, and did all these things that made me better. So I would say, yes, part of that should be the institutional academy or patrol academy but they should not use that as a crutch mm -hmm. and do it on their own being more self-reliant all right Ayazia fraser says no tim fiddles are quite difficult to play trump plays them like the cheap kazoos they are uh they're also expensive yeah so uh good good point fair point uh point taken and accepted i just can't get over like being you tells me how good i am like what yeah <laughs> how talented i how am incredibly I talented trump's so great man he he does he does. Uh, uh, he has these lines that you're just like no one in the world would script this for you. I just whoever would try to recreate a Trump speech, I I just I can't imagine what that task must be like. All right, all right. Manifest of Destiny says Tim, if you call bourbon whiskey one more time, I'm going to declare a Kentucky fatwa on you. All right, all right. Point taken. Point taken. <laughs> okay. All right, we got well, we got way too many super chats today, but I really appreciate it, guys. Um, Aaron Bisogno says, Tim, huge fan and paid member. Thanks for inspiring me. I'm currently running for city council in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've been going door to door in my Don't Snake Me Bro t-shirt and it's working. Nice. That's right, man. The machine is terrified that the culture is shifting to such a degree. You know what I, you know what I noticed something today? I hate Netflix. I just finished watching Lock and Key. Have you guys heard of that show? No. Mm -hmm. Three seasons and they've canceled it. And that's it for me. I am done with Netflix. I liked that show. The third season sucked. And I was like, that's a bummer. They canceled the show. They run all of these shows for two seasons and then cancel them outright. I wonder why that is. They're also charging now, what, like 20 bucks a month or something. They're putting commercials in. Don't they want to crack down on password sharing too? Yep, yep, It's like yep. their famous threat. A big part of it is probably because the actors' contracts are up and they're going to have to get and renegotiate 10x Maybe, if they want to keep but my, them on. My, my point is, I wonder just nobody's watching their shows anymore. Like the culture is decaying. But then I look at the Daily Wire just hiring a Disney executive to be their, their CMO. I think chief CMO. And uh, like their influence is taking over. I wonder if the old guard is already doomed and we're just watching them slowly now slump off and fade into, uh, into the distance. And I was realizing as I'm watching Netflix and I'm like, all of these shows were canceled. Like, why are you showing me shows with no resolution? I'm not going to watch 10 episodes of a show and then be like, but they canceled it too bad. That's what, that's, that's lame. And that's what Netflix is right now. So I'm looking at what's going on and I'm just like, yo, uh, the culture war, we are winning it. And they're panicking over it. They're going after Trump. They're going after Jones. They're freaking out. I think there may be dark days ahead for sure, but it's a transition to a new world order, man. And we're involved. We're, we're transitioning it as we speak. It's, it's a great debate yeah steve graves radio says i believe a civil war is avoidable if enough regular people speak up and express their honest opinion that is why i took your advice and created a youtube channel called steve graves radio very grateful to any feedback and subscriptions uh, yes. glad to hear it man yeah that's the unfortunate thing we talk about it quite a bit people who are uh, who are afraid to share their views because the machine will punish them and it's like but the like it's a paradox the only the, it, the only reason the machine will come after you for speaking up for your opinion is because no one does. Mm -hmm. If literally right now, every single Trump supporter just came out and put a Trump flag on their lawn, the machine would invert. All of a sudden, all the Democrats would be like, I, 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 I was always a Trump supporter.
because they see the widespread popularity in their I, city. I don't know if if signage is the way to go. That's kind of a virtue signal thing. Being, but making a fucking channel and speaking your mind is is number one. See, I think you should also just have these conversations honestly with people around you. I think so often people avoid talking about not even politics, just like things you believe in, your values with your friends and neighbors because you're afraid of seeming different or isolating them or maybe making them feel judged, which is obviously a sin. You know, to a certain extent, you just need to both live your values and be open about your values so people who may not share them can act, talk to you about them in a reasonable way. I think it's great if you want to make an out online platform to, to reach other people, but really it should start at the building block, which is like on your street in your community. I guess we were both right. Yeah. I just, I, okay, I don't, I'm <laughs> open to signs. I'm not saying don't do it, but I think that's also a way for the deep state to target people. If they go around, they just find all who See, and signs. I, I'm not like, you don't have to put a sign in your yard, but I do think that like, if you don't feel like you can tell the people you think are your closest friends, who you voted for and discuss openly, like when you have differences of opinion, then you are probably not being honest with the people around you. You're never gonna be able to have authentic progress without that. Dude, the internet video changes stuff so rapidly. It happens so fast when a lot of people start doing it and community gets comes out of it, it's great. Yeah. That's the best part of this whole thing is like, even these long form discussions from four different people from different walks of life, like people are more interested in that because it feels more real because it is real versus, you know, talking heads, telling talking points. Like who wants to see that anymore? The future of, I think, media across the board is what this is and different forms of it, which I which I love. That's what I digest. I don't even I don't subscribe anymore to institutions, especially woke ones that have an agenda. I'm more interested in free thought and ideas and then and then collecting those people, like even the Daily Wire, because they have diversity, and then collecting all that and then absorbing it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, and share the show if you really do like it. Head over to TimCast.com. We're going to have the Uncensored After Show coming up at about 11 p.m., plus all of our other shows. You can follow the show at TimCast IRL. You can follow me at TimCast. Mike, do you want to shout anything out? Yeah, just philcrassarival.com, americancontingency.com. All of our content we do for free. Like it's the content release, the podcast, all the things that we do is to get you informed and educate you to to provide you value. If you see value, then dig deeper in the weeds. Right on. I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. I recommend you check it out every day for your news updates. You can follow me on Instagram at HannahClaire.B. Thanks so much. You can follow me, uh, good through to me from IanCrossland.net if you want to follow me on social media. Fantastic, Mike. It was really great to see you, man. Thank you as well. And Thank if you. people want to follow you, I know they can follow you personally on Twitter. Uh, Mike yeah, Glover. What Mike A. Glover 1 and then Mike.A.Glover on, on Instagram. Yeah. Great stuff. Thank see you, you later. Thank you guys all so much for tuning in. Thank you, Mike, very much for coming this evening. You guys can follow me on Twitter and minds.com at Sarah Patch Lids, as well as Sarah Patch Lids. Me. We will see all of you at TimCast.com. Thanks for hanging out. Bye, guys.